Yo, it's your friendly neighborhood night out here, and man, it sure has been a long time since I last talked about a video game on this channel. Let's go ahead and fix that. Crash Bandicoot, a series first envisioned and created by developer Naughty Dog, is a franchise that for many who grew up with the original PlayStation 1 needs little to no introduction. However, even now you'd be hard pressed to meet someone who plays video games who hadn't at least heard of the famous orange marsupial, especially when he's so often associated with the upper echelon of mascot platformers who have stood the test of time, with the likes of Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog. Through the series' highs and lows, it's always had a dedicated fan base, which at the moment is a pretty damn good time to be a part of, and with the release of Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time being sort of the uh, Sonic Mania level event for many a fan. And while there is a little bit of a drought again going on with Crash and unfortunately especially Spyro with Activision being bought out by Microsoft and all that shit kind of being up in the air, we do at the very least have Crash Bandicoot 4 which was pretty much everything I could have asked for in a new Crash Bandicoot game. But nonetheless, I knew all the way back in September of 2020, God has it really been that long since Crash 4 has come out, I knew that I would eventually want to make a self-indulgent, extremely long video video series about Crash Bandicoot and wax poetics about a series that holds a special place in my heart uh, right next to the likes of Spyro the Dragon, Sly Cooper, Sonic the Hedgehog, you get the picture. Today I want to specifically talk about the original trilogy that started it all. I'll be coming over the original PS1 games detailing pretty much all of my thoughts, talk game design, themes, as well as cover the differences in art style, design, and whatever other stuff is different between the original PS1 games and the Insane Trilogy remasters. This is going to be a long one, so get comfy. Get yourself something nice to drink and snack on, and let's spin our way into the original and insane Crash Bandicoot Trilogy. The 1996 original Crash Bandicoot is an interesting game from the get-go when you compare it to everything else like it at the time. 3D platformers as a genre wasn't really defined by anything at that point. In fact, as a genre it basically wasn't anything at all. Before the inception of the PS1 and the N64 and 3D based consoles, a 3D platformer was more of an abstract idea than an actual thing that you could pick up and play. Jump back and freeze frame through the holiday season of 1996. We have three games that came out within a short span of time for one another, all of which were 3D platformers, and all of which were trying their best to interpret how to best make a platforming game in a 3D space. It wasn't an easy task because it wasn't a task that had really been accomplished up until that point. It was developing an entirely new thing. Even the most seasoned of game developers had to adapt to it as they were all used to developing in games in only a 2D space. With anything that was 3D being extremely experimental and very early, and pretty rare in general. But with this generation, the niche and experimental was now the new standard. It was now or never. Sink or swim. 
One of those three games was none other than Super Mario 64, which honestly should need no introduction. It's literally the game that came to define the genre of 3D platformer, a collectathons, maybe even what it means to be a 3D game more abstractly, with the entire industry largely following in their footsteps. It had real 3D environments, experimental but extremely fun to play with controls. Immersive and imaginative environments, it, it blew people's minds, needless to say. So, how did the other two 3D platformers fare? Well, one of the other three 3D platformers was Bubsy 3D. An infamous laughing stock of a game with no textures, terrible controls, an even worse camera, and a textbook case of a dev team that had no idea what they were doing, why they were doing it, when it would be finished, where it was going, and just frankly, how to make a 3D game in general. So, uh, comparing Mario 64 to a Bubsy 3D, I don't think you could really get two more opposite outcomes, really. So then, what about the third game? Well, as you might have guessed, the third game was Crash Bandicoot. And from the beginning, Crash took a different, and some may say more direct approach than either Mario or Bubsy, as well Nintendo was going after a free-roaming, open space, obstacle course philosophy to their level design, and Bubsy was trying to function at all, Crash Bandicoot instead took what already worked with 2D platformers and simply flipped the perspective, which is why the game was codenamed the Sonic Ass Game, all throughout its development. On our way across country from Boston to Los Angeles, I think it was Iowa that we decided that we wanted to make a character action game. And by the time we left Iowa, we had decided that we wanted to do it in fully 3D. What we did is we said, how do you move a 2D game into 3D? What would it be like if you put Sonic the Hedgehog in 3D? And what we realized was that the simplest conceptual way to do this was to take a 2D world that was flat to you and simply rotate it like this so that the gameplay happened without movement to the left and right, but rather in and out. This concept we called Sonic's Ass. You'd have a game where you're always watching Sonic's ass. Yeah, because the camera would be behind him. So we, we jokingly called it the Sonic's ass game. It was a game designed like a 2D platformer, but in 3D. Now, some might mistake this choice as playing it safe compared to the likes of Mario 64. That Mario 64 had created basically an entirely new genre of game. That it had flipped the script, that it was cutting edge, that it was different. And that Crash Bandicoot, as good as it may be, was a 2D platformer at its core in 3D. But again, remember what a 3D platformer was as a concept was not at all defined by anything at that point. It was all pretty abstract and conceptual, an idea in the heads of game devs in the late 90s. So, to put the record straight, nothing at that time was playing it safe. Due to this core design choice, however, the gameplay of Crash Bandicoot is purely linear, like its 2D Big Brothers, with the goal of each level being to reach the end of said level, uh, or the warp pad, and then move on to the next level, rinse and repeat, a core design philosophy that would, for the most part, stick with the franchise moving forward. Crash Bandicoot was also a technical achievement for the PlayStation 1, as it was able to boast highly detailed graphics and animated characters for the time, due to how it spooled RAM from the PS1, which I won't go into how exactly they did that, but there are some excellent videos I've linked down below uh, showcasing exactly what they did, explained by the game devs themselves. And I mean, Bubsy 3D should be evidence alone for just how bad this experience can potentially be. Not to mention that this generation was full of both innovation and creative constipation, as the likes of Sega spent a whole console generation trying to figure out just how to get Sonic to work in 3D. With the likes of Sonic Jam's small hub area, Sonic R, and the cancelled but well-documented Sonic Extreme being all the blue rodent 
could muster that whole generation. All because Sega was struggling big time to make that transition from 2D to 3D. Well, and that in Sonic's gameplay is a fair bit more complex platforming wise than say Mario or even Crash Bandicoot. So translating its momentum based platforming from a 2D space to a 3D space was going to need a lot more dev time and experimentation. But the result was the same. A whole console generation without its mascot character having a mainline game. But I think that really speaks to the struggles even seasoned developers, industry kings had during this transition. Sonic would eventually hit the landing successfully, come the Dreamcast with the likes of Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2, both being landmark 3D platforms and extremely innovative themselves. But that was the next generation. That whole console generation without the famous blue boy would leave the door open for others to take his place. Which is one of the reasons I believe characters like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon were able to make an even bigger impact during that generation, since Sonic was notably absent, leaving room for some new edgy, cool, and lovable mascot characters to fill in the space he once filled. Beyond all that though, the first actual Crash Bandicoot game and its design philosophy has become a bit divisive over the years, as while Mario 64 is a much more easygoing game full of exploration and discovery, Crash Bandicoot is, and at its best always will be, a more technical and skill demanding game. Everything from platforming, enemy placement, and the various obstacles in your path in Crash Bandicoot is meant to make you feel nervous about that next jump, with entire levels being designed around this tension filled platforming. But before we get into all that though, perhaps it's best if we first get acquainted with the story and setup for this PlayStation classic. We open our tale where all great epics begin, the Instruction Manual, as read by Dr. Neo Cortex. The story of Crash Bandicoot follows the tale of Dr. Neo Cortex, an intelligent, devilishly good looking genius and his below average assistant Dr. Nitrous Brio. No. Cortex is the proud owner of three of the nicest islands just southeast of Australia. The renovations are still underway with two of the three islands. I am, <clears throat> I mean, Cortex is a man of big dreams. Dreams to one day become the ruler of the earth, to become a god among mortal men. A dream he hopes to accomplish through his latest creation, the Evolvo Ray. With it, he mutates various animals living on the islands into beasts of superhuman strength, creating an army of superpowered furries. Everything was going according to plan. He had even found the perfect animal to be his brave general in this army, a bandicoot. However, when he attempted to use his next, newest invention, the Cortex Vortex to control the bandicoot's mind, it backfired, rejecting Crash's mind and allowing him to escape. Cortex decides it's time to start experiments on the female bandicoot, Tawana who Crash grew very close to over their time in captivity. And so, Crash must go on a mission to Crash Cortex's world domination party, venturing across three islands and fucking up everything. And all so he can get some bandicoot piece of ass. <sighs> fucking bullshit. Crash Bandicoot's story is fairly simple, like most 2D platformers before it, and takes some heavy inspiration from a certain blue hedgehog. What, with a small rodent going against an evil doctor, a bent on world domination through the power of controlling animals. With that said though, the comparison ends there, as Crash, while he definitely has some level of attitude based on his look, his actual mannerisms beckon more to a simple-minded, but well-meaning hero with a major psychotic edge. With the instruction manual describing him as a heroic, seriously agile, 
recently evolved marsupial. There's also a bit of a Dr. Frankenstein parallel going on here, in more ways than one actually. While Sonic and Dr. Robotnik's relationship as rivals stems from the fact that Dr. Robotnik uses his technology to control animals and nature, Sonic is more of a symbol of nature and the inherent chaos that comes from it. I guess one of the more easy ways I could put it is Robotnik is the law root kind of guy, wanting to take others' free will and establish a new order with his technology, controlling all that is uncontrollable. While Sonic the Hedgehog, on the other hand, is a chaos root kind of guy, who believes in freedom, adventure, and in many ways is again a symbol for the unstoppable force of chaos that is nature, something which a man may try to control, but is ultimately uncontrollable. Crash and Cortex, on the other hand, also have a bit of this as well, with Crash clearly being a chaotic figure who largely represents nature, and Cortex again representing man's hubris and law, generally speaking. But where it changes is the fact that while Sonic exists separately from Robotnik, Crash exists because of Cortex. So Crash and the subsequent destruction of all of Cortex's plans he brings with him all happens as a direct result of Cortex playing God, which is narratively quite similar to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein novel, though obviously it's all under a more a cartoony lens here. The instruction manual also further ties into this connection, with Cortex being a man who was mocked by the scientific community for his outlandish theories, much like, well, Frankenstein. Oh, and also Cortex's right-hand man, Dr. Nitrous Brio, is just literally the Frankenstein's monster from the classic A Universal film, aesthetically. So there's also that, I guess. Though I should note that Dr. Neo Cortex also has a little bit of a Dr. Moreau from the H.G. Wells novel, well, The Island of Dr. Moreau. What with it taking place on an island and the anthropomorphic animal people things, you get the point. Speaking of the manual, I absolutely adore the little character profiles, giving a little more information into the world of Crash Bandicoot. Like how Brio was actually the one who created the infamous Evolve Ray, but due to his lack of self-esteem and being easily pushed around, he let Cortex take all the credit. Or how Boss Ripperoo went crazy due to being hit with the Evolve Ray too many times. Or the boss Pinstripe, who somehow is a mix between a local omnivore and a bunch of cheesy gangster movies. Meaning I guess the Evolve Array can warp animals' minds in very specific and amusing ways. While it may be small details, it makes these cartoony characters all the more fun to see. And while unfortunately in this first game, outside of the opening and ending cutscenes, and the instruction manual, we don't really get to see a whole lot of dialogue or or interaction with these characters, this is an area that would be far more expanded upon in later entries in the series. But design-wise, these characters definitely do speak for themselves a bit. A lot of the character designs were inspired by the classic Warner Brothers Looney Tune cartoons, with exaggerated designs meant to fully express who each character is at a glance. Crash is a wild mad lad, Brio is a Frankenstein's monster mixed with a mad scientist, Koala Kong is a bodybuilder meathead, Tana is furry bait, the list goes on. Considering the limited technology at play, Crash Bandicoot certainly succeeds at that cartoony character design. Hell, before the game is fully finished, it was originally going to have a fully animated cartoon intro and outro, as showcased here. Cortex is a genius, a mental aberration. He's totally fixated on world domination. The local <laughs> island creatures are dull and obtuse. Until the evil doctor turns on his juice, he wants them for his troops. They come out in income hopes, most especially Crash. Crash Bandicoot should have been a genius, but he doesn't quite compute. Crash! Crash Bandicoot! 
good. Anything can happen now that Crash is in pursuit. Tom has been selected for running through the blender. Crash will fight to save her. He'll never surrender. He'll vanquish any villain to set his girlfriend free. He doesn't have a clue about how to proceed. His heart's in the right place. His brain's been rearranged. Unsuccessfully. Crash! Crash Bandicoot! If Cortex isn't beaten, he'll reign absolute! Crash! Crash Bandicoot! Play our game and tell your friends so we'll make lots of loot! You can really see that Looney Tunes inspiration here. It also feels pretty similar to the likes of Tiny Tunes and the Animaniacs from that time frame as well. In fact, before we figured out that this was supposed to be a alternate intro and outro cutscene, a lot of people just assumed this was supposed to be the intro to a lost Crash Bandicoot cartoon that was going to come out during that time, or was maybe pitched or something like that. In case you're wondering, this cartoon intro and ending would later be cut in favor of the fully 3D ones seen in the game, as to better show off the PlayStation's technology at the time. But I've been talking for nearly 20 minutes and we haven't even gotten into the gameplay of the game. So why don't we take a jump through all the levels of this game, starting with... Fear not, plumber boy, the bandicoot will come. I'm coming to get you, pal. Hi, how are you? Am I on the right street? Can, can you tell me where Nintendo is? People run a lot here. This is really nice. Plumber boy, your time has come. The first few levels of Crash Bandicoot introduce the core design ideas and gameplay in an intuitive fashion, with various design elements being slowly introduced to the player. The first level in Sandy Beach is a fairly laid back setting, has slow moving enemies, is very easy to get three Aku Aku masks, showing off Crash's superstar like power up through it, and unless you're trying to get the gem here, you are unlikely to die in this level. More on that later. It's also somewhat unique in that it transitions from one soundtrack to another at this point. Nothing more to add, just figured I'd point it out. Before you get to that point, there's also this area where there's a bunch of stairs with boxes and stuff on it. There's no obstacles here. This is just purely put here to make sure that you have a good understanding of how Crash is able to jump and get over obstacles and moving within a 3D space. Then the peaceful jungle setting of the second level introduces the infamous TNT crate or bomb crate in Japan. Jump on it and it starts counting down from three until... I think it's pretty obvious what will happen if you haphazardly spin it. This level also introduces the crash staple of patience-based obstacles with these jungle rollers, as well as tonic coins, which if three are collected, take you to a bonus round level, which also works as a save point. Well, actually, these bonus rounds are your only save point in this game. So, uh, don't be a tool and die in them. Otherwise, you'll miss out on your chance to save your game. This is one of the major changes from the original to the Insane Trilogy version, as you can now save at any point in the game in the Insane Trilogy version. However, don't think that that makes these bonus rounds completely useless now as to properly compensate for being able to save at any point. In the Insane Trilogy, the boxes that can be found in these bonus rounds now count towards your total number of boxes needed to break to fully complete a level in the Insane Trilogy. Whereas in the original, these bonus rounds are your save points, but these boxes in here are just 
purely bonus boxes. I actually think this is a very good change in the Insane Trilogy, because before there was really no reason to ever get all the boxes in these bonus levels, especially some of the more tricky ones later in the game, because it was never worth the risk of not being able to save your game in the original, since again, these boxes don't count towards your total needed. So they have less, but also more value in the Insane Trilogy. Kinda funny that. The third and fourth levels introduce new camera angles, with the former being a much more traditional a 2D platforming angle, and the latter being a reverse camera level. Crash works remarkably well in a 2D space as he traverses the island's native wall, perhaps a testament to the 2D platformer influence of the game's core design. The boulder level on the other hand is a bit less intuitive. While the reverse camera levels are overly hated in my opinion, this camera angle would prove to be a bit more difficult to manage given Crash's controls. A strong criticism with the first Crash Bandicoot is notably how stiff Crash Bandicoot feels. Everything from jumps, movement, and even attacks feel very weighted. Now mind you, the controls given time can be mastered, uh, but to compare it to Mario 64 again, Mario feels tight, but with many moves at his disposal for traversing landscapes, while Crash's moveset is far more limiting. Each jump can only be conquered one way, good timing and patience. This type of platforming game design is not at all inferior to Mario 64, however. It just simply focuses on more tense time-based platforming, while Mario 64 often thrives in just the opposite. I'd say, however, the hardest part of these boulder levels can be maneuvering between these signposts, since, weirdly enough, it seems that Crash slows down a bit when moving diagonally. What is not difficult, however, are the jumps in these levels, which many complain about there not being enough time to react to. No, there's actually plenty of time to react to every jump here. If you're having trouble here, then you're just bad at the game and need to get better at reacting properly. What's more is in the Insane Trilogy, these levels now have tighter controls because, well, Crash controls better in the Insane Trilogy. You have far more control of Crash's movement due to it being true 3D movement, thus making moving past the signposts no problem anymore. I'll get back to this key difference later, uh, but I guess what I'm saying for now is stop huffing that camera angle excuse copium and get good, son. The fifth level is yet another change in camera angles, this one being overhead, as Crash jumps on lily pads and over man-eating plants in this peaceful stream all the way up to the first boss battle of the game with the local native chief Papu Papu, who is laughably easy. Even when they tried giving him more hit points in the Japanese version of the game and the remake to make him just a little less pathetic, it's still pretty damn pathetic. If you play it out like you're supposed to, then you're supposed to time your jumps over the fat man's staff, dodge his smack, and then hit him on the head. Or you can just, you know, jump on his head three or five times and never give him a fucking chance to do anything. Of course, this is just the first boss. And after this, I would argue that the game's kid gloves are officially off now. Every level after this point expects you to understand all the core mechanics of the game, as it will now be challenging you in every possible way it can. With the very next level, Rolling Stones upping the ante with slightly more tricky platforming and obstacles, as well as the first appearance of the Dr. Nitrous Brio coins. Collecting all three of these types of coins will take you to a secret bonus level that's frankly the hardest ones in the game. It's a major difficulty spike if you ended up going into the one in Rolling Stones. These levels in particular focus on TNT based platforming like this, and in a few select cases require expert level knowledge of how the arc of Crash's jump works. Like with this one here, which takes a little finagling with the directional buttons. Funnily enough, I find that these challenges are actually a little more difficult in the Insane Trilogy uh, due to the speed at which you land from a jump being faster. The momentum of jumps in general seem to be a little bit faster in the Insane Trilogy, and you also really need to hold the jump button down all the way to land some of these tricks. Making for more control but faster timing needed at the same time. 
Now, do you know that that might be my years of replaying the original casting, a bit of a bias over this, mind you, but I figured I'd note a consistent difference in feel between these two that I've personally noticed. In the original game, these Brio bonus rounds are completely optional and reward you with a ton of lives for beating them. Though, since this game gives them out like free candy, it's not that big of a loss if you don't beat them. However, in the Insane Trilogy, the boxes from these Brio bonus rounds also count towards your total crate count. So if you want to complete the game, in this version you will need to conquer these platforming puzzles. Which I actually think is an excellent change, especially since the Insane Trilogy allows you to keep trying bonus levels over and over and over again with no penalty. So it really just comes down to the game asking you to meet its challenge. It also gives these challenges a purpose besides bragging rights, because again, if you're good enough to get through these no problem the first try, since you don't get a million tries in the original, lives are probably not that big of a deal or reward for you considering that you are literally a master at this game at this point, and are going out of your way to do these platforming puzzles because you just want to. The next level, Hog Wild, is, well, Crash is a filthy boy, I'll tell you that much. Anyway, you ride this hog, jump over pits, and bob and weave through the obstacles. It's pretty easy, though that one boar being cooked at the very end can make for a very tricky jump, especially in the Insane Trilogy version, uh, due to the timing being a little bit more tight. But overall, it's a nice change of pace. A before Native Fortress. This is the final level of the first island, and a true test for everything you've learned up to this point. Before we get into the actual level though, I did want to note something rather personal. As a kid who was pretty bad at Crash Bandicoot 1 in particular, I'll never forget swinging around the camera on the first island, looking at all the details, and then noticing that there wasn't just one island, but two other islands in the background, one of which was clearly Dr. Cortex's from the opening cutscene, which, given how difficult I already found the game, since I couldn't get past the first island, it really made Crash Bandicoot 1 seem like a truly daunting adventure, one that if I don't get better at the game, I may truly never see the end of. Because, after all, all the struggles that I'm going through now are clearly but only the beginning of what this game had in store for me. It was an interesting feeling, because the first series I ever played, like ever, was the Spiral the Dragon trilogy on the PS1. And while those games certainly have some difficult parts, overall I had a pretty good time playing them and beating them as a kid. So much so that I probably beat each one of them well over 20 times. They were my virtual playground of choice. While on the other hand, the very next series that I dared to try out was Crash Bandicoot, and at the time it seemed like something that was truly impossible. And yet, something, something kept me coming back to keep trying over and over and over again. I rarely feel that exact sort of awe with video games these days, that specific feeling of simultaneous dread and excitement for what challenges come next. With the uh, Dark Souls series being one of the only examples in recent history that I can think of giving me that exact feeling. Now, this isn't the part where I say Crash Bandicoot is the Dark Souls of 3D platformers, by the way. It's just more difficult than, say, Super Mario. Seriously, y'all need to just settle down and learn to get better at 3D platformers. But yes, for 9-year-old me, Crash Bandicoot 1 might as well have been Dark Souls. And I firmly believe it is one of the foundational blocks in why I enjoy difficult and even at times punishing games uh, to this very day. But that's just a personal note I felt like including, memes be damned. Anyway, the Native Fortress is a pretty long level with lots of obstacles strung together, 
It really does feel like a fortress, the last line of defense from getting off of this fucking island. And near its very end, or in the second half, it has some particularly tricky jumps, but as always, can usually be conquered with just a bit of patience and watching for the pattern. It also has this cool little secret in the second half, where if you jump on this little turtle's back, and up and on to this flat piece of wood, you can skip past one of the most difficult sections in the level. Hi, of course. Never use this skip, because I am a Crash Bandicoot god, but I figured I'd throw you a little bone. And with that, the first island is conquered. Stop looking at me! What's wrong with these people? Never see a bandicoot before? If you haven't noticed by now, the original Crash Bandicoot is very experimental, as one of the first 3D platformers would be, I suppose, with various camera angles and perspectives being tried out in just the first few levels of the game alone. And as we jump from the peaceful jungles and simple native villages of the first island, the second island immediately ramps up the difficulty and intrigue, as Crash jumps through ancient abandoned cities, dark and desolate temples, and over misty and rickety bridges. The levels like Sunset Savannah can be outright gauntlets of patience as you watch for patterns in constantly moving walls, shifting platforms, enemies that move in odd patterns, and bottomless pits everywhere. While other levels like the Temple Ruins offer a new camera perspective, the pitch black emptiness of the pits below swallowing the orange marsupial as he jumps over crumbling platforms, dodging various booby traps and venomous enemies, all while quiet music delicately allures to the mystery and danger all around you. It's also one of the few levels where the camera is truly dynamic, switching between these wide over the head shots to emphasize the black void, to back behind Crash in these tight hallways with smashing walls and bats flying about. Road to Nowhere, and while we're at it, the high road levels have become rather infamous as of late for how ball-bustingly hard they can be, with some even claiming that they are objectively broken, which is of course objectively wrong. These are the levels where you saw a lot of Let's Players and stuff at the time straight up give up on the game because they just could not get past them. And furthermore, their reputation has gone above and beyond. Similar to Crash 1 in general, there is this reputation it has as being this hard as nails 3D platformer that is extremely punishing with some people even going out of their way to say that it's too difficult or that it's archaic in its design, or even going so far as to say that the game is and always has been a bad game and is difficult because of bad game design. I actually remember a fair few videos coming out at the time uh, when the Insane Trilogy had first come out, uh, noting how the level design was somehow dated, that there was quote unquote, poor depth perception that was due in part to the fixed cameras and that that made these games difficult because they had a bad camera and in some cases people saying that the games even had objectively bad controls. One of the best examples of this being a video by YouTuber Snowman Gaming. And I don't mean to throw any hate anyone's way, especially for a video that's over four years old, but my god is this a bad video but one that I think is a good case study into understanding why people feel this way about Crash Bandicoot 1 and possibly the series as a whole. So I've played Crash Bandicoot 1 and 2 a bit as a kid, but never got too far. I remember bits and pieces, but for the most part I went in with a fresh mindset, especially looking at it from an analytical perspective this time around. The Insane Trilogy looks beautiful, and it's cool to see Crash in high definition, but all of the level design from 20 years ago is still intact, for better or for worse. When the stages turn into 2D sections, it's a little better, and yes, you can get used to the distance Crash can jump eventually, but don't worry, they make up for it with a plethora of running toward the camera levels, which are still a big nuisance since you can't really see what's coming next and requires a lot of trial and error. Now I... I don't want to be mean. <laughs> but looking at some of these clips and the arguments being made during them, 
More depth perception and a fixed camera that can't be moved at all hasn't been changed, resulting in a lot of deaths purely from having a bad perspective of the platform. Hitboxes seem fickle, and Crash overall feels slow and cumbersome to move. The boss fights especially felt frustrating as there's no margin for error, and getting hit once will start the whole battle over again. Combined with poor conveyance of what exactly can hurt you, this leads to many deaths that simply don't feel justified. It it kind of seems like you're kind of, uh, well, you know, bad at the game. I know it's not exactly constructive to say a get good scrub, okay? That's not what I mean by this. But you're falling into pits that are meant to be easy jumps, jumping directly into enemies' mouths, jumping directly at bosses while there's TNT bombs around them, which I'm pretty sure is a clear indicator that you're not supposed to hit them then, arguing that there's poor conveyance of what can hurt you while you're literally jumping into an enemy UFO, which has the burning red hot stuff around it, which has been indicated throughout the rest of the game to be dangerous. And you have the nerve to say that these deaths weren't justified or that the game is fundamentally broken. And not just the original, but the entire PS1 trilogy. Now, they added a slide move to make Crash move a little faster in the sequel, and Crash 3 certainly has better level design and movement options. It even rewards you with new abilities when you beat a boss, which is excellent. Unfortunately, all the variety and wacky situations can't repair a fundamentally broken game. It should also be noted that his solution to fixing the difficulty of the game is to uh, have even more checkpoints and more Aku Aku masks. A simple fix that I think could have alleviated many of the issues would be to just add more Aku Aku masks, which are essentially Crash's health, to allow for more mistakes to be made. When the game already has plenty of both. He also notes that the checkpoints seem to be placed arbitrarily. Some stages are long and grueling with very few checkpoints, but others are quite short and have plenty of them. Adding just a few more masks here and there would have made the arduous, tense sections without any help much more manageable. Plus, a bonus stage acts as a checkpoint when you finish it, so there's no need to have a checkpoint box right next to one. It truly seems like checkpoints and masks are arbitrarily placed without any forethought. Which again is wrong, they are placed after a particularly difficult section of each level. Also that specific example with the bonus round right next to the checkpoint is disingenuous. Bonus rounds are meant to be optional challenges. If you go into them, obviously you'll get a checkpoint right there. But if you don't want to, it would be pretty weird of the game to punish you by it serving as the only checkpoint in that area. Now there are some levels where the checkpoints are meant to be spread more out. Um, we will get to that momentarily, but one such example is Slippery Climb, which only has one checkpoint at the halfway point of a level. But this is not arbitrary, it's meant to be a difficult fucking level, which only has one checkpoint, so you better not fuck up. It's not arbitrary, the game is asking you to meet its challenge. But getting back to the core point here, he eventually of course talks about the bridge levels, in particular, the high road. But when all is said and done, there are simply some really bad jumps in here. Probably the best example of all these gripes is the level High Road, which requires precise platforming on breakable planks and jumping on turtles to cross huge gaps that are too big to cross most of the time, even if you feel like you did everything right. Crash's jump requires some momentum to get to full speed, but you're given less and less space to work with the further you get into the game. So if the turtle isn't on the very edge of the bridge and you don't get enough of a lead up before you jump, it's impossible to make this leap. If you can run through your entire stock of 30 lives on one area of a level and none of the deaths feel like they were your fault, you might have a problem with your game design. If you go into a level and die 30 times and feel as though it's the game design's fault and couldn't possibly be because you're just not very good at the game, well, gosh, I hate to break it to you, partner, but you might not be very good at the game. 
Now, I don't want to go through every single point of this video, and it would take a while to do that. But something interesting is Snowman Gaming later compares Crash Bandicoot to this 2D platformer that's kind of similar to Meat Boy called The End is Night. And something he says is that death is expected in this game. That it's a teaching moment instead of a punishment, which is an interesting way to look at it, you know? I wonder, you know, since Crash Bandicoot is a game that gives you lives constantly, like literally just tons and tons of lives, I, I wonder if possibly death is expected in the Crash Bandicoot game too? No, no, that, that, that couldn't possibly be it. Uh, Crash is a fundamentally broken game after all. I mean, it wouldn't have anything in common with uh, The End is Night. Except for the fact that they're both supposed to be challenging platformer games that are rewarding to finish by the sheer fact that you are conquering difficult challenges. But I guess The End of Night has good controls and Crash Bandicoot 1 and the Insane Trilogy in general have bad controls because, um, because they're hard games and I can't beat them so that makes them bad. The reason I wanted to point this video out in particular is because it was a mindset that again I've heard a lot about Crash Bandicoot as a franchise. And I just feel as though all of these arguments are a little bit unfounded, you know? The one good point in the video is that the Insane Trilogy did have a bit of an issue with its hitbox, where all of the platforms had a bit of a pill shape to them, so certain levels and challenges did seem a little bit more difficult than they were in the original games. Uh, and they also, like I said before, Crash Bandicoot falls faster in this game than he does in the original, so you do have to react a bit faster in the Insane Trilogy versus the originals. Does this at all bring break the games or make them unplayable? No, it, it literally doesn't. The only one that was kind of objectively a bit botched was the high road in the original release of the Insane Trilogy uh, that had to be patched a year later. But if he was only talking about that level, then I wouldn't really have as much of an issue with this video. It's the fact that his arguments are clearly about the entire trilogy of Crash Bandicoot, including having a difficult time on its, frankly, extremely easy but pretty fun boss battles, which we'll get to in just a moment. And look, if you don't have fun playing difficult 3D platformers, that's understandable. It's not a game for everyone. My only grievance comes when people claim that the games are fundamentally broken or that they are somehow in need of fixing because the person playing the game isn't good at playing the game. But needless to say, I personally feel that these bridge levels are actually super duper fun, especially when you actually know what you're doing on them. They're meant to be intimidating, nerve-wracking platforming challenges that reward quick movement, something that makes these levels jarring I think to most players, as the game had up until this point sort of reward more patient, confident jumps, whereas now the game is telling you to make quick and confident jumps. Yes, the turtle part in the remaster can be rather difficult, uh, but once you understand how it works, all you have to do is literally do a jump arc onto the turtle and then hold the jump button down and you'll go flying over to the next section. That's all you gotta do. It's not that difficult. It's again, yet another puzzle to be solved. Once you've solved the puzzle, you'll probably almost never have an issue with this section ever again. And just a heads up, it was also a nerve wracking and difficult part in the original game as well. So subjectively, these are some of the most fun levels in the game for me personally, because I enjoy the challenge. And you, on the other hand, can subjectively hate them because it is challenging and you don't like the amount of challenge the game is asking of you. But objectively, just because you can't do it because the game is asking for more than you are capable of doing doesn't make the game fundamentally broken. Poo boy. Now that I got that ramp out of my system, let's talk about the bosses on this island, which are without a doubt an upgrade from old Poo Poo. Ripperoo being one of my all-time favorites as it's 
all about timing when to start detonating the big DMT to screw over the crazy kangaroo, as well as paying attention to his set jumping pattern with each subsequent hit taken off of him. Though it should be noted that you can kind of cheese this boss by just going into this corner and well, hitting the TNT in time for him to eventually go over and hit it. Koala Kong, on the other hand, is mostly a test of dodging rocks while keeping a distance from ticking TNT crates, which can make for a fair few tense jumps here and there. I also like the little characterization of Koala Kong here, uh, opening himself up for you to spin a rock back at him because he just really needs to flex his big muscles. I also love Ripperoo's laugh here, even if it is a stock effect laugh. It's the first time I ever heard it in anything, so I always associate that laugh with Ripperoo. <laughs> Something I think is best finally noted here also is the art direction and general changes to the setting of these levels from the original to the remake. Crash Bandicoot environment wise has always gone for a more naturalistic setting. And I think this at times can look absolutely beautiful with the graphics on the PS1. And so too can look beautiful in the remake. But that being said, I do think some things are lost in translation as we have the technology for video game environments to look, well, even more natural and realistic. But then there comes an issue. While Crash Bandicoot's original environments are meant to look realistic uh, by virtue of being on the PS1, they still end up looking pretty cartoony, which given worked very well since Crash was a cartoony character. But with the Insane Trilogy remake, they decided to up the realism of both the environments as well as the character models. And while this does look nice in places, so much of the cartoony charm is lost because of this. We are also working with a more natural lighting system, which in theory should make things look really fucking good. And in some cases it does. Take for example, Koala Kong's boss arena. Look at that glow up. While other environments like the Lost City and Sunset Vista just don't quite look right to me. Look at the original with these red walls from the sun slowly setting, contrasted with the blue and gray tones of the shadows and decrepit old ruined environments, a jungle of bright yellow and orange, trees in the middle of these two extremes, and then down below, a dark black water with a cartoony little animation to signify movement. Combine that with the naturalistic environment details, faces and art from a civilization long over dead, and you have in in this one frame, a beautiful image. So much contrast, so much color. Now, how does this exact same image look in the remake? The intense reds are gone, replaced with a more unnatural looking sunset. The bright yellows and oranges are almost completely gone in the background. The dark blues, eh, they're still there in a few places but they don't have the bright red to contrast off of them anymore. And the water, clear as day and oddly enough, totally still. I suppose this area does look more realistic here, but overall the art direction and for lack of a better term, vibe are really cast aside for its sake here. That said, this isn't an extreme example of where I feel they missed the mark. There are times when the more natural lighting adds to the original idea of the level and art direction, such as with the Temple Ruins, where the more natural lighting makes Crash's fur illuminate with this bright orange fire that makes the level look even more dark as there is now an even greater contrast. Add that with the little cobwebs and misty air and you have a level that I think looks pretty damn good in the remake. However, where the art design actually really shines in the Insane Trilogy is over on the third island. Feldman, Joseph J. Feldman, Joseph J. According to my research, you're in the market for a new game system. Are you aware, Mr. Feldman, that Sony's PlayStation has more than 150 games? NHL Face Off 97, Jet Moto, Tobal Number 1, Destruction Derby 2, Crash Bandicoot. I could go on. I'm going to give you a personal demonstration. Get off my lawn, you freak. I'm coming up. Don't you say?
Finally, we move from the ancient ruins of the second island and on into the coal technology-driven mechanical castles of the third, Cortex's abode. This is where the game truly starts to shine, as the soundtrack goes from an ambient, sometimes peaceful, sometimes lingering background noise to full-on techno music, big bombastic tunes, and dark mechanical pieces that not only create a beautiful contrast with the past levels, but also amp you up as you run through Cortex's operation personally. Your goal is now within sight. It's finally time to fuck some shit up. Levels like heavy and castle machinery toss you into a world of robots, heat pipes, jump pads, and moving platforms that make your orange marsupial friend here stand out particularly well. And boy oh boy did they ever deliver here in the remake visually. Pipes with some green sludge dripping off of them are now massive systems of toxic waste that glow a vibrant green. The brown walls now are more clearly metal walls with pipes and wires connected to them. In general, everything just looks more detailed and grander in general. On that note, I also really love this string of levels near the very beginning of this island due to how they tell a small story. You jump into Cortex Power, an over-the-head power plant full of toxic waste, a various heat pipe, robots, and rat mobsters. <laughs> yeah, this level has various branching pathways, some of which lead right into the clutches of these pistol-shooting gangsters. All while this mysterious but determined techno soundtrack plays in the background, almost as if to signify Crash's unwelcome but unrelenting entrance. Heading into the next level generator room, suddenly things get dark. A great contrast to the deep inky blacks of the temple ruins, this level now shows the bottomless darkness of Cortex's mechanical heart to his power plant, as well as himself, what with all the TV screens with his face on them, a la 1984. Add that with the dark and at times incoherent buzzing, an odd cacophony of sounds and beats playing in the background, and you have a genuinely eerie atmosphere for a level. Something that was downplayed unfortunately in the remake, with the soundtrack here being a lot less creepy and Cortex's animations on the TV screens being, well, just goofy looking compared to the weirdly ominous animations in the PS1 original. Nonetheless, by level's end you see something that stands out. Danger, safety first, CEO Pinstripe Pataru. This is the first time a boss is formally introduced to the player before facing them. Well, not counting the two doctors, of course. Something that quickly adds intrigue into who this character might be. Then we jump into the very next level with the best fucking music in the game, Toxic Waste. And the level itself being a hallway full of toxic waste and more rat gangsters tossing barrels down the hallway, making for a level that is kind of like a 3D Donkey Kong level, uh, from the original arcade game, I mean. This level is also great because it's not only fun to speed through with the straightforward level design, but given the context to what comes next, you realize that this whole hallway is a final line of defense towards Pinstripe's office, the head of this operation. Now Pinstripe himself isn't that interesting as a boss battle. You mostly just need to hide behind these pieces of furniture as the mad Potaru, yes that is a real animal by the way, blasts bullets around the room with his tommy gun while laughing maniacally. He's pretty easy to knock over, but I appreciate his enthusiasm nonetheless. Pinstripe is without a doubt my favorite of Cortex's minions, maybe uh, right alongside Ripperoo. It's just a shame, unlike Ripperoo, we never really got to see much of Pinstripe in the future titles all that much. But I really wish that we did, and I mean, if there's a Crash 5, it'd be really cool if he was in it. Because I mean, he is a mafia boss after all. He could be a really cool side villain, perhaps independent from Cortex. Like many of the villains in this game would come to be after the first one. But alas, an owl can only dream of his crazy, a Patoru boy ever getting in the limelight of a mainline Crash game again. <sighs> 
Anyway, it's a fun and memorable encounter that ends with the power plant being destroyed, capping off that little story. From there, you'll be conquering the infamous High Road level, which I think I've talked about enough already, and then you'll be climbing up the gothic and stressful ledges of Slippery Climb, which I believe is really the apex of the platforming in the original Crash Bandicoot game, because you're gonna need to use all your skills to get through it, from extremely tight platforming challenges to kind of confusing patterns in how the platforms move, to an overall extremely tense atmosphere not only through the dark and dreary music but also because there's only one checkpoint at the halfway point of this level meaning that this is the level that pretty much demands the most out of the player to have it finished for all these reasons this level is often considered the hardest level in the game now funny story about slippery climb is that is difficult as it is it is actually the dumbed down version of what was going to be a much, much more difficult level. That level being called Stormy Ascent, which we'll get to in a moment. Once you get past Slippery Climb, you'll then be traversing through the haunted halls of Lights Out, with a new mechanic of Aku Aku being used as a light source to guide you through the level's various traps and dark pits. Then we have the Jaws of Darkness, which seems like it's going to be an underwater level given where it is on the map, but it's just another temple level full of hidden pathways and secrets around every corner. I really do love this level, especially all the hidden paths that you have to find through, well, the Wumpa Fruits kind of guiding you the way. That being said, it does feel a little out of place on this island at this point in time, mainly because everything else on this island seemed to have clear indication that it was owned or built by Dr. Cortex, whereas this just kind of feels like more like a level that came from the second island. But, oh well. After that level, you go into Castle Machinery, which if you had just so happened to have collected this colored gem on your way through the game, you'll get this secret path. <laughs> Glorious. And then you'll make your way up to Dr. Nitrous Brio, of which he has a fairly interesting boss fight. He'll throw green beakers of green slime that you must jump on to hurt him, as well as dodging his deadly pink exploding beakers. A funny note, in the original game, the green slime monsters take off his health for, well, no real good reason. And while it's not at all a big deal, I do really think it's cool in the remake that they decide to make them squirt green goo in his eyes when you hit them. Just a little detail that adds a little bit to it. Then, just as the boss battle looks to be over, he drinks his own chemical concoction and turns into a hulking green monster. This is mostly for show, as the actual boss is super easy from this point onward. But it is nonetheless a pretty cool final encounter before moving into the finale. Also, his new defeat animation in the Insane Trilogy is pretty cool as well. On that note, all the animations in the Insane Trilogy are quite well done. The final level in the game is the lab, a great gauntlet level with banging soundtrack that screams, this is it. It's time to end Cortex's plan once and for all, with various Cortex henchmen, hidden traps, quick and tricky platforming, all leading up to the final battle. Well, after you jump over this one pit in this level after the Great Hall, which we'll get to again momentarily. The final boss sees Crash on top of Cortex's Zeppelin, the mad scientist's tower of machinery and evil all burning behind him. You've destroyed all of his projects, defeated all his minions, now it all comes down to this. Cortex will shoot various projectiles at you, the green ones being able to be hit back at him, the red ones you'll just have to dodge, as he will always shoot them directly at where you're at, and the blue ones fly across the screen which you have to jump over. The boss itself isn't all that difficult, but the combination between Cortex's constant laughter, all the levels you just went through burning behind you, with Cortex's more subdued but climactic theme playing in the background, it leads to his strangely fitting final boss battle that ends with Cortex falling to his doom. Well, for now anyways. And Crash going home into the sunset with his big, bosomed, bandicoot babe by Blimp. Plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff. I got a little surprise for you here. Check it out. What do you think about that? 
got real time, 3D, lush organic environments. How's that make you feel, buddy? Feel a little like your days are numbered? I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. You're hurting my elbow. Is that Italian? No, Bandicoot, it's an Australian name. I think it's time we get to the Bandicoot in the room. This game, if beaten in a standard or casual fashion, is a challenging yet overall rewarding and fun game at its core. If, however, you're attempting to 100% complete this game, you are suddenly taking up a gauntlet, a challenge of infamous proportions. See, in order to fully complete the game, you need to collect all of the gems. You get the gems by smashing all the boxes in a given stage, which is pretty standard. But, in Crash 1, you need to get all the boxes in a given stage and get to the end of the level without dying a single time. This can already be a feat within itself, with some of the real long levels like Sunset Vista being particularly difficult. However, not all levels' boxes can be obtained without collecting a colored gem that opens a new path for Crash to get those few boxes in. You know, sometimes when you go through a level and it seems like you got every single box, but there's still a few missing? Yeah, it's because there's probably a path you needed to open up by collecting a colored gem first. Which, the game doesn't really do a very good job telling you where the colored gems are. Without a guide, it can become quite an arduous mess. Not to mention that the Cortex Coins, yeah, there's also Cortex Coins in two select levels. Cortex Coins unlock their own bonus rounds that must be completed in order to gain keys which unlock two secret levels which also have gems to be collected. The only problem with that is that the Cortex Coin rounds are also TNT based puzzle rooms, which while not at all as difficult as Brio's, can be rather stress inducing because if you mess them up, you have to play through the whole level over again, collecting those coins over again, just to get another chance at getting the key. And many people have claimed that 100%ing Crash 1 is not only difficult, but unfair. I would strongly disagree. The game is very difficult to 100%. I say this because I believe Crash Bandicoot 1 is not an unfair game in general. And since 100%ing the game just means that you beat every level at least once without dying and getting all the boxes, I don't think that's a particularly crazy feat to accomplish. Nerve wracking, intense at times, very disheartening when you fuck up just as you were about to get one that was really difficult, yes. But unfair, no, not at all. What all this hard work ultimately gets you in the end is the ability to jump across all these gems in the Great Hall level and before the final boss and to get to Tana so you can both fly off and away into the night via a bird. So you basically get an alternate ending where you save Tana, like in the normal ending, but now you didn't beat Cortex and he's still up in his world domination plans tower, which kind of makes this alternate ending way less satisfying for all the hard work that you have to put into getting it. On the other hand, the thing that is kind of worthwhile getting is this epilogue for all the boss characters in the game, which weirdly enough follows the canon of what happens when you beat Cortex first. So you get the epilogue for the normal ending of the game by getting the alternate ending in the game. Am, am I the only one who's enough of a dork to give a shit about this? Yeah, I guess so. Might as well pull out a marker and draw a big old D on my forehead like Dr. Neo... C you know what? That didn't come out. Never mind. Now, it should be noted that most of the difficulties in getting 100% in Crash Bandicoot is pretty much null and void in the Insane Trilogy remake, with most of the gems being able to be collected, death or not in the level, so long as you just collect all the boxes, making 100%ing the game a lot more in line with the Crash Bandicoot sequels. Now, the color gem levels, which are now clearly shown in the menus before you jump into each level, those levels still require you to make a perfect run of the level, still keeping the tradition and the difficulty of a few of those levels. 
Overall though, this is much more manageable for most people I'd imagine, while still being fairly difficult since you will still also have to complete all those Brio challenges in order to count as getting all the boxes in some of those levels. Personally, upon replays of the first game, I don't often 100% the original game, though I have done it a few times by now. And that's mainly because there's not a whole lot of new to experience by collecting all the boxes, you know? It's just going through the level, collecting everything, and not dying at the end of the day. There are a couple of very short hidden paths that you can unlock by getting some of the color gems, uh, but besides that, that's pretty much it. I go out of my way to collect the Cortex coins and his, well, corresponding keys more often than not, because those unlock two extra levels, so they're a lot more valuable in my book. But that said, I usually always 100% complete Crash Bandicoot on the Insane Trilogy, mainly because it's really fucking easy to do so. So if you've never played these games, or at the very least you've never 100%ed them, I'd highly recommend definitely 100% completing the Crash Bandicoot 1 on the Insane Trilogy, but also maybe do it just once on the original game. As daunting as it may be, it is an exhilarating feeling when you finally get that gem and that extra long, extra hard level finally conquering it completely. However, what is actually extremely funny to me is that even though the original Crash Bandicoot is harder to 100% complete than the Insane Trilogy, the true most difficult challenge for this first game actually does lie inside the Insane Trilogy. That challenge being Time Trials. Time Trials and their corresponding collectible, Relics, was a new concept added in by the third game, Crash Warped, which I'd like to discuss more in detail, well, when we get there. But it's a pretty simple concept overall. You gotta beat the level as fast as you can. You do this by not dying, taking extra risky jumps, and hitting number boxes that freeze time for a set amount of seconds, as shown on the boxes. There is usually three times to beat, all of which will get you a relic of the corresponding time. The normal difficulty is the sapphire time, the hard difficulty is the gold time, and the expert difficulty is the platinum time. In case you're wondering, getting all the gold time relics is what is required to get the achievement on PlayStation, Steam, etc. The platinums are for your own self-satisfaction and braggery. The sapphires, on the other hand, well, they're for losers. Now, this is all well and good, and I'll be talking in detail about why this was such a cool idea and how their inclusion is telling of the design philosophy that went into Crash Warped. But, as you can see, I'm still talking about Crash 1. If you recall, Crash 1 is all about patience-based platforming, taking your time and then making confident jumps. What the Relic's inclusion do is tell you to throw all of that shit in the trash and learn to play the game like a madman, constantly taking risky jumps, memorizing level layouts and fucking platform cycles, etc. The game was not really meant to be played like this. And so with that in mind, you better start learning to play like a speedrunner, because if you don't, you're never getting those fucking relics. Now don't get me wrong, many people on the internet Pretty much everyone on the internet who has done these relics for the Crash 1 game, as a matter of fact, will tell you that they are bullshit and that they probably shouldn't have been there, but I guess it was an okay, nice, happy little thing to include, but ultimately that they're not fun and not worth doing. But, because I constantly have to have the hot take regarding this game, I actually think the time relics in Crash 1 are really, really fun. Primarily because you now have to approach every single level totally differently. Because the game wasn't built for speedy platforming, you now need to break it down, pull it over your knee, and bust its patience-based platforming ass until you've got it down to a science. And that can be extremely rewarding and is definitely a brand new challenge for uh, <coughs> Crash Bandicoot veterans like myself. That said, the skill level required for some of these times is godly. 
but not impossible, mind you. The times required for at least gold relics, which is what I personally go for since this at least fulfills the achievement status on PlayStation and Steam and what have you, can be fairly lenient on some of the really long levels like Sunset Vista, making it more a challenge of simply not dying in those levels and keeping a moderate pace rather than a perfect one, like some of the shorter level time requirements as an example. Remember how I said completing the original Crash Bandicoot 100% is a test of patience? Well, going after even just the gold relics, but especially if you're crazy enough to go after the platinum ones in Crash 1, makes doing that task seem like literally nothing. Because now, you can't mess up and you gotta be doing it fast, or in a platinum relics case, almost as fast as possible. Needless to say, this is on a totally different level of skill, but it is yet again very rewarding all the same. And honestly, playing the whole game again like this made me realize how short some of these levels actually were when you just throw caution to the wind and fucking go for it. It takes some real understanding of the game's mechanics and technical skill to pull it off, but it is well worth at least going after the gold times in my opinion. As for the platinum, I got a few of them, but I'm not quite crazy enough to do that. But anyone who is, I tip my shades to you and raise you a glass of cold wumpa juice. You are truly a legend. Also, oddly enough, it kind of made me come to the revelation that some levels you don't even need to be patient for at all. You can just keep running and jumping and spinning and the obstacle cycle will just kind of magically work around you running immediately. I'm gonna assume that was just a happy accident, but it was a really cool revelation all the same. On that note, the final thing I want to bring up is Stormy Ascent. I mentioned earlier that Stormy Ascent was originally the level that Slippery Climb uh, later replaced because the devs thought that Stormy Ascent was just way too hard. Well, years later, through emulation and game shark codes, people found a way to actually play that original Stormy Ascent level. And there's several old YouTube videos from back in the day that showcase this. It was a fully finished level. Well, besides the Tonic Coins not working, and, well, yeah, it's not only a hard level, it might be the hardest Crash level ever made, period. Though, when we get to Crash 4, that's gonna be put into question. It has everything atmosphere-wise that Slippery Climb has, but with the addition of some of the trickiest split-second reaction time, intense platforming that I have ever fucking played. Well, as a bonus of sorts, you can actually play a fully finished version of this level the coins and all in the Insane Trilogy. And it is just as difficult and truly a deep cut treat for longtime Crash Bandicoot fans to finally have a fully finished version of the level playable in the main game. Something I really love about this level as well in the Insane Trilogy version is instead of Tana coins, they made the coins you collect in this level be Brio coins and created a brand new Brio bonus round that is legit the most difficult one in the game game, and is again a real test of your skills and knowledge of how the game's platforming works in the same way that the level itself it comes from is. I love Stormy Ascent, and while I do agree it would have been a bit too hard to fit right where Slippery Climb does in the OG game, and mainly because nothing else after it would have gotten nearly as difficult, I do really love having it as a bit of bonus content, with the ability to fucking time trial it no less. That is just badass. エイ、ブラッシュバンディクを戦える踊りです。さあ、皆さんご一緒に。3D オクスクロールアクションゲームクラッシュバンディクしかも4パッチプレイステーション Crash Bandicoot is a game at its core all about carefully but confidently planning your next jump where each successful jump there comes another obstacle, enemy, or pit in your path or in a relics run fucking most of those mechanics in the ass and telling them to go cry about it 
as simplistic as it is, I think there is a charm to it that is hard to exactly pin down. I would say that the remake and the original are pretty on par with each other as far as, well, which is best to play. But in this case, I'd actually say that the remake might edge the original out a little bit, given the difficulty for completing the game is a little bit easier, but also at the same time, fully 100% completing it, or going after the relics, actually adds to the game a considerable bit. Uh, plus, it also has tighter controls, generally speaking, and besides a few strange music tone changes and the odd Lost City color changes ruining the vibe, this version of the game brings in a lot of net positives overall. And plus you're able to save at any point in the game, so that also, I think, helps a lot. Though I'll always advocate being a Giga Chad and just playing them both. Because, I mean, why not? It's not that long of a game and it's worth going through at least twice. Not to mention, you know, you could, like, use this cool emulator called Duck Station and, like, have the game look fucking awesome on your PC. And while the game is not perfect by any means, and the platforming, no matter if it's a little faster in the Insane Trilogy as far as reaction time needed, or a little bit too stiff in places like in the original, it is all the same, still one of the first of its kind, warts and all, and I really wouldn't have it any other way. With all that said, the future of this series must have been looking bright when the first game came out, a to major acclaim in sales numbers, going on into being one of the best-selling PlayStation games of all time. A sequel was practically guaranteed. Would it improve upon everything that the first game established? Would something be lost along the way to making a bigger and better sequel? Would it live up to one of the first and greatest PlayStation classics. Of course it did. This is Crash Bandicoot 2. Would you just get on with it already? I don't think I'm rustling any feathers when I say that Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back is better than the first game in, well, nearly every conceivable way. And keep in mind, you just saw me suck off the first game for nearly an hour and a half. I'm not fucking playing around here. Improved visuals? Check. Better character models that more adequately represent the cartoony art style with smoother animations and is overall just more Looney Tune-esque? Check. More story and a bit more depth to the characters? Check. Tighter controls, better jumping mechanics, and overall movement, new abilities, more enemy variety, better boss battles, it's all here. Um, well, bosses aren't that much better, and some are um, actually worse. But besides that, everything else here is a notable improvement. This shouldn't come to anyone's surprise, of course. Often in the world of video games, the sequels are almost always better, since... Much of the time, dedicated to making new IPs is, well, just that. Figuring out a new IP, getting some baseline ideas and designs into the game. And in Crash Bandicoot's case, figuring out what it means to be a 3D platformer to begin with. The sequel is almost always working with taking all the things that really worked with the first game and making it bigger, cooler and grinding away some of the jagged edges or things that didn't quite work in the original. Or at least a well done sequel does all those things. A good example of this in my opinion is Sonic the Hedgehog. The first game is a classic that started a revolution. It is a stunningly well designed game. But the sequel is where the series became legendary. And the same can certainly be said for Crash Bandicoot 2. We won't have to delve into the lovely smelling crevices of the manual this time around, as the entirety of the story is pretty well conveyed to us straight from the get-go through the opening cutscene of Crash 2. <clears throat> well, things didn't really work out for an old Cortex. He reached for the sky to grasp the very stars and fell back down with a painful thud. However, when he did fall, fate tempted our handsome genius, as he just so happened to fall right beside the Master Crystal, a near endless source of power, potentially. <coughs> Skip ahead and Cortex went from Virgin Zeppelin to Chad Space Station. He, along with the help of his 
Luckily, new friend engine. We were able to discover the secret of the crystal's power. Unfortunately, nothing in Cortex's life comes easy. To unlock the master crystal's true potential, they would need to collect 25 slave crystals. Cortex would have gone and sent his loyal minions to go and fetch them for him. But, ugh, well, they didn't really like him anymore. They were probably jelly of his space station. Furthermore, they lacked vision! <laughs> like a game reviewer complaining about 3D platformers' depth perception, they lacked the vision to properly see the truth of the situation. Huh. So, instead, Cortex enlists the help in the most oh, unlikely of places. That orange rat, Crash Bandicoot. Quite a devilish scheme, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty cool to have full-on cutscenes now showing off not only the much more expressive 3D models, but also presenting an interesting sequel hook. Though what's always been funny about this plot is the game is called Cortex Strikes Back. The whole beginning of the game is dedicated to setting up his grand plan. Yet, in the actual game, Crash Bandicoot isn't, well, all up there so to speak, and does what Cortex asks him to do. As the player, this is a little bit weird since we clearly know that this is all a trap. Coco, who we'll get to in a minute, also tells you this is all an evil plot. And even Brio comes out of the woodwork, if you collect a gem in this game, to tell you how he is actively working against Cortex, and he will try anything he can to stop you from fulfilling his plans at any cost. In fact, the bosses and enemies in the game, besides a few near the very end, are all working for Nitrous Brio to stop you from getting Cortex those crystals. Though, much like Crash, you're probably here to just mindlessly collect shiny shit and you'll deal with Cortex later, so I guess it's not that big of a deal. As mentioned, new to the cast is Coco Bandicoot, Crash's little sister, who is tech savvy and seems like Crash's opposite as far as brains are concerned. Now, some of you may ask, where the hell did Tana go? Well, I don't fucking know. There's reports about her being cut out due to her being too sexual. There's other reports about wanting to move past the character because Sony really wanted to change her so they figured they might as well just make a new character entirely. I don't really care honestly though because Coco is a much more defined character uh, straight from the start. It helps that she talks I suppose and she works as a better sidekick for Crash conceptually in my opinion. Of course I did like the whole Jessica Rabbit and Roger Rabbit thing Crash and Tana had going on though. Though I believe there's actually a Crash Bandicoot 2 manga that says something along the lines of Tana broke up with Crash because he was too immature for her. Wow, what a fucking bitch. Don't call me up next time your ass needs saving across three fucking islands. Of course, that's not really the canon answer, but it is kind of funny to imagine it is all the same. Moving on to gameplay, one of the biggest things you will notice between Crash 1 and 2, besides smoother controls, is the Warp Room. Working as a basic level selector and hub world, you now have the ability to pick from 5 levels at a time in any order that you wish. You can also save here in this room at any time you want. No need for passwords or bonus rounds this time. On top of that, in each warp room above each level, it shows all the items that you'll need in order to complete the level, including the crystal, gems, and color gems that are in each level. Making the guessing game, or more likely Google search for finding out what things you need to collect where, completely unneeded, unlike the first game. Being able to choose between five different levels at any given time also gives the player a bit more agency in how they want to approach, well, each level. Unlike the first game where if you get to a hard level, you're pretty much just gonna have to fucking conquer it straight away and there's no getting around it, if a level is giving you particular trouble in this one, you could always just pick a different level and deal with that one later. You will still, of course, need to finish that hard level, but it does give you a little wiggle room. We haven't even picked a level yet, and already this game has managed to fix most of the issues or complaints one might have with the first game. Adding to that, as I've mentioned before, Crash now moves much more smoothly. 
Crash's jumps and jumping arc are not only far easier to control, but he also has a new slide move allowing him to get under obstacles as well as do a slide jump or super jump, allowing you to jump super far distances even over certain obstacles entirely when done perfectly adding an entirely new layer of skill and diversity to his moveset. Speaking of obstacles, there are now far more dangerous brothers of the TNT crates, Nitro crates, introduced into this game. They are basically instant death boxes and can be quite intimidating for just a simple box of how they bounce and beep, just waiting eagerly for the slightest touch to blow them up. There are also enemies that can only be beaten with a good jump, while others can only be bested with a spin to them, and yet others can only go down with a well-placed slide kick, utilizing Crash's moveset in a natural way. And what's more, despite what some other YouTubers might say, Bind with poor conveyance of what exactly can hurt you. The enemy's cartoony designs make it extremely clear what move you need to use for which, and which will have you killed by comparison. There's also now a bonus round in nearly every single level, with them now working as a fun change of pace and means of collecting all the boxes in a given level, rather than a save system. Having the bonus rounds actually be a little bonus round is how they work best in my opinion, since they can now be little bite-sized challenges and platforming puzzles you can freely try again and again until you get them right. With all these additions though, the core gameplay of Crash 2 is still quite familiar to anyone who's played the first one. You get from point A to point B in a level, avoiding obstacles and pits and what have you along the way. As aforementioned, you will also need to collect the crystal in each stage to mark it as fully finished though they're not exactly hard to find. They're usually found about two thirds or so of a way through a level. You would have to be a moron to miss them basically, since this is a linear game and well, you're always gonna come across them. Which means if you do miss them on purpose, you get some interesting dialogue from Cortex. No, 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 Crash. I said bring me the crystals. Now, get back in there. That's actually a pretty funny detail for something almost no one will see without fucking around. You can bet my child self was blown away by the fact that Cortex would actually say something if you didn't get him his crystals. You can get him to say something else if you miss it again. No, 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 Crash! To save the world, I need crystals. Crystals! One more time. They look like this. Crystals, Crash! Go back through one of those doors and bring me crystals! And yet one more thing if you fail one more time. Look above the doorways. Above each, there is a big crystal-shaped slot. Fill all five crystal slots in this warp room by retrieving one crystal from each of the five areas. Only after we have filled all of the slots in this room can we continue on our quest. This is the last time I will remind you. There's actually a lot of little details like that in this game. Like if you abuse this poor, poor little polar bear baby in the second warp room, she'll get a bunch of lives. Or if you do dare to explore anytime there is a path off the main one, you'll find yourself down a new rabbit hole of secret paths, secret levels, secret warp rooms. There's just so much to explore and find in this game. Even though the game is at its core, still very much that same linear level design platforming, there is more than enough secret routes and bonus content to be found that the game is actively screaming at you to leave no stone unturned, which I believe is probably the single biggest improvement from Crash 1 to Crash 2. You see a platform that looks like you could walk on it by jumping across a bunch of boxes on a river? Go for it! You think it might be possible to make a super jump across this pit in the polar bear chase level? Try it! Hell, I remember as a kid feeling so wicked smart when I noticed that there was a staircase of nitro crates that weren't quaking and beeping like normal, and finding out that if you did jump on them, they lead to a secret path to one of the colored gems. I also remember wondering how I was supposed to get the blue colored gem from the first level in the game for quite a while, until one day I had a random thought that 
that maybe if I didn't smash any of the boxes in the level, it would give me the blue gem. Like how smashing all of them gave you the silver gem to begin with. And then I was absolutely fucking floored and so proud of myself when I found out that I was actually right. It's stuff like this that makes Crash 2 so rewarding when you're going for that 100% run. Which I'll also say is one of my critiques of the Insane Trilogy. Since at the beginning of every level in the Insane Trilogy, you get this little hint for some kind of secret in the level. And in the second one, they literally just tell you what to do or what to look out for to get the secret gems or pathways. I guess it's one of those things that more people prefer so that they waste a uh, less of their time trying to figure out what to do. But I still think that the level design more than gives you enough hints for secret paths without this blatant walkthrough hint at the start of levels. Still, it doesn't ruin the experience or anything. I just felt like noting it. Crash 2 also has a variety of interesting locations that you'll be seeing the Bandicoot running through, with a primary theme of snow running throughout the whole game, environmentally speaking. Which is an interesting choice, since that was one of the few types of terrain slash environments that you never really got to see in Crash 1. I mean, I guess there is the bridge levels, but those are sort of their own thing. There's also some classics like the deep jungle levels with branching paths, or the tricky ruin levels, which are especially atmospheric in this game given the pitch black lighting and never ending pits below. Some of the highlights showcase Crash 2's stunning level for detail and level design, such as the second level in the game Snowgo, where you'll discover the Nitro Crate firsthand, the new ice physics of the game and how Crash's slide move propels you forward, and finally once you're past the initial start of the level and into the side-scrolling ice caves, anyone with a keen eye will notice that a big fat red gym is sitting right there just out of reach taunting you it's the first major hint in the game that not all is as it seems for these levels that there must be some sort of secret path to get up there it's pretty clever there are levels where you get to ride the little polar bear around in a similar fashion to how you would the hog in crash one but the main difference is the controls are once again much more tight and you can go at these levels at breakneck speed if you know what you're doing making them a nice change of pace amongst the normal platforming stages. The boulder levels also make a return from the first game, now being much easier than they were before, with the room for error being even more generous. However, there is this level that takes most by surprise, starting out with the front-facing camera, having one assume it is yet another boulder level. But instead, it turns out that you're running away from giant bloodthirsty polar bears. That's cool enough as is, but then for the grand finale of the level, you then have to jump on the back of that baby polar bear from before before and run away from the giant polar bear. Quickly dodging and weaving in and out of obstacles, it's a downright iconic moment. Then later you have levels like Air Crash, one of the many river levels with the cool jet boards. Well, during one of those jet board sections, you'll notice that there is this lone island piece just off to the right. And if you're either curious or trying to find any secret path at this point to collect all the gems, you'll notice that there is a line of boxes that is easy enough to be able to jump onto to get there. If you're daring enough to try it for yourself, you'll find that the island is a secret warp pad that takes you to the secret warp room. Here you'll find the secret entrance to the second level snow go again, but this time you'll be thrusted into an ultra difficult platforming challenge full of nitros, spinning penguins, spiky hedgehogs, and slippery ice physics that you'll have to start using to your advantage now in combination with the super jump, all leading you back to the very red gem that was teased all the way back in level 2. Finally, yours for the taking. But I'm not even done. There's also the snowy mountain, alpine levels full of strange enemies and obstacles that never really appear in any of the other games like these explosive spit spewing plants or these bees that will chase Crash as soon as he passes them with the only way of avoiding them often being to run or dive underground. You know, just like a real bandicoot would I suppose. 
and to sneak past the obstacles. And I have even gotten to the Cortex space station levels. These levels being the finale of the game will test out every move that you have from required super jump platforming, quick and confident movement to get past shrink rays as well as even a little bit of puzzle based platforming through some of the secret paths here. Enemies that will go from a spin to kill enemy to a jump to kill enemy at a moment's notice, stomping pistons and in spaced outs case a multicolored gem path that unlocks if you've collected every color gem in the game to unlock a gauntlet of yet more tricky time based platforming challenges. Then jumping on to something really different you have the jetpack levels which pretty much covered every aspect of the marketing of this game. And for good reason, I suppose, since if you played the first game, seeing Crash in a jetpack, I think really sells the sequel and what it really is. A game that is proudly shooting for the stars, confidently into new places. Step through, sir. That's odd. Nip out your pockets. Huh. Are you wearing a watch? Oh, for goodness sake. Every time I come here. After a short vacation, Crash is back. And this time, he's ready for just about anything. I am not comfortable with this. Whoa, hello. Best in the the jetpack levels I noticed tend to get a bit of a bad rep online, which I think is mostly up to them originally having inverted controls in the OG game, something you can change in the settings of the Insane Trilogy. I however have played far, far too much Star Fox 64 to let inverted controls trip me up. These levels may come at the very end of the game, but I personally think that they're a ton of fun to play through and add a nice bit of variety by game's end. Not to mention that they have a banger soundtrack at that. I could go on a while longer over every level and why each is a chunk of dynamic and interesting level design and constantly rewards skill, exploration, and experimentation, but suffice to say Crash 2 is in a league of its own, far and away outdoing its predecessor in this regard. Guard, which was nothing to scoff at either, mind you. Crash 2 is just a far faster game than the first, and while there will still be those bits where you'll need to be careful and time your jump just right, most of the levels can be sped run without too much punishment, so long as you know what you're doing. In that regard, I'd say Crash 2 is definitely a much easier game than Crash 1. Some of that comes down to level design, and some of that comes down to Crash having a much more powerful moveset at his disposal here. That's slide jump really changes the game. Like I said before, I honestly really, really enjoy the platforming challenge that is Crash Bandicoot 1 and everything that it brought to the table. And once again, I think far too many people judge that game's core design far, far too harshly. That being said, Crash 2 is still not a super easy game by any means. I think Crash 2 letting loose the chains a bit and opening the door for experimentation and speed makes it a far more replayable and more enjoyable game to me overall and hits the right spot between rewarding difficulty and freeform platforming for me personally. I guess what I'm saying is, is Crash Bandicoot 1 did what it was trying to do pretty perfectly and Crash 2 did what it's trying to do pretty perfectly as well. And between the two packages, I just happen to like two a little bit more than one as a complete package. Though I will say one nitpick I do have is a lot of the level themes seem to repeat a lot more often in Crash 2, and they seem to have a lot more in common with one another besides a bit of an uptick in difficulty from variation to variation. Like by the third level where I'm going up some fucking river, I'm almost always done with this setting in particular. Same goes for the snow levels at some point. Also, one of the benefits of having levels progress in a linear fashion like in the first game is it often feels a lot more like a big grand adventure. It's a cohesive narrative from start to finish. While in Crash 2, levels feel a lot more segmented, even if they are deeply connected secrets wise, there is definitely a bit of a disconnect narratively for me. Each warp room does have its own cool theme, but the levels there within don't reflect that theme at all. I mean, sometimes they do, but it'd be like one level out of the five. Again, this is more of a minor nitpick, as the benefits of having a level select and dedicated save room do make things a lot more convenient. 
Plus, if I'm being totally honest, I don't know if I would want five jungle levels and five snow levels, etc. in a row either. Because again, that wouldn't really solve the problem either because you can pick any level you want in any order. Meaning you really couldn't tell a good story through the level progression like you could with Crash 1. Again, with the example of Pinstripe's Operation or Cortex's Tower. Speaking of bosses, they are kind of hit or miss, to be honest. They aren't bad, mind you. In fact, many of them aren't that far off of Crash 1's bosses. But I think with almost every other aspect of the game gameplay-wise being improved and built upon, the bosses are pretty disappointing by comparison. Let's go through all five of them real quick, and I'll also give a suggestion or two for how I might change each boss to have them be just a bit more complex to better line up with Crash 2's overall jump and improvements. I'm not saying I could do a better job or anything, it's just... Hindsight 2020 perspective, I guess. Ripperoo returns as the first boss of the game this time around, and I love how he's now an apparent avid reader and genius. It's a nice little bit of character development for that crazy kangaroo. As for the boss itself, well, basically all you gotta do is learn where the one spot he's not gonna toss, a TNT or nitro tiles are, stand there, and then hit him. This boss is much better the first time you fight it, but every time after that, it's kind of boring once you know exactly where to stand. It's not a bad boss, mind you, and it is the first one, so it should probably be the easiest. But I do think it would be a little bit stronger if Ripperoo chased after you to some degree with the Nitro part of his attack, so that you would have to run away from him. This would at least add a little bit of variation to the boss fight, and what is otherwise a stand-in-the-corner simulator. Boss 2 is the Komodo Bros, who are design-wise really fucking cool. Too bad the whole boss can be beaten by mindlessly running around in a circle and, well, that's it. I do like the idea of the two brothers working together to kill Crash, though, and I often wonder if these two are a bit of a cheeky way of spitting at the Mario Bros, with one being short and fat and the other being tall and skinny, but it could be a coincidence. But they were competition at the time, after all. This boss would be way better if they had double the health, with them both going between Mo spinning Joe into that cyclone attack he normally does, and then Joe maybe taking Mo's place and Mo charging towards Crash until he charges into a wall and gets dizzy, so that he can then be spun into Crash, with the last hit having them both go at you at the same time, and then you having to spin them into one another. Something that utilizes them both at the same time, and again, adds to the complexity of the fight. Boss 3 is Tiny Tiger, a character that would become a staple in the series after this point, and I'd say that this is actually of the best boss so far. You have to jump on these falling platforms, and Tiny will mimic your every move, so you gotta trick him into falling into the pits. He is a pretty intimidating character to have running after you, though this can be cheese with a well-timed super jump. I wouldn't change really almost anything about the boss besides maybe just one more hit point where Tiny starts jumping across two spaces instead of one. Except for when the player is standing still, of course, so he doesn't just get stuck jumping over you over and over again. So that you actually have to utilize your super jump and keep an even faster pace. Think faster than your feet for just one more round to trick Tiny into falling. But it's not necessary, and overall, this is a pretty good fight. Next would be the best boss in the game by far, Injin, who is ready to collect the 20 crystals that you have collected for Cortex thus far in the game. Injin has a giant mech with rocket launchers, laser arms, and a death cannon, all of which will be attacking you in platforming patterns. Between jumping and dodging all his attacks, you need to throw Wumpa Fruits into his weapons, inner layers, till the fruit juice gets so sticky they literally blow up. It's a great boss battle that I really wouldn't change at all, given that it's already very unique mechanic-wise, and has a pretty good difficulty and overall spectacle to it as well. With such a cool boss, you're probably wondering what cool thing is in store for the final boss. Well. For the final boss, you chase Cortex down a long hallway and hit him three times in 20 seconds, um, and that's it. Game over. Okay, okay, so you gotta dodge some mines and some fucking space rocks, but they don't even kill you or hurt you. And the only way you can actually lose this battle is by letting him run all the way to this portal where he laughs and you die, I guess. The final boss music here is pretty damn great though. Too bad you have such an anticlimactic and super short, if you're doing it correctly, battle to accompany it. 
especially with how the last five levels really build up to this final confrontation. Seems like you're finally attacking Cortex's shit in Minions now. Something that makes his facade of trying to act as if he was the good guy melt away as he starts acting like the threatening megalomaniac that he truly is. <laughs> <laughs> yes! My plan is nearly complete, and I have you, Crash Bandicoot, to thank for. Engine! What's happening? What's that? Is he stealing our signal? Clancy Brown is playing Cortex here for the first time, and he really brings this character to the next level, sounding menacing with an air of authority to him. Engine, you fool! She's telling him everything! Ah, yes. We're, uh, we're, we're back now. Pardon the, uh, interruption. Crash. Bring me Chris. However, Cortex's current voice actor, the guy voicing him in the insane trilogy here, Lex Lang, is nothing to sneeze at either. Though his interpretation of Cortex is a fair bit more comedic in tone, I still really love his performance and what he brings to the table as well. <laughs> yes! My plan is nearly complete, and I have you, Crash Bandicoot, to thank for it. Engine, what's happening? What's that? Is she stealing our signal? Engine, you fool! She's telling him everything! Ah, oh, yes, we're, uh, we're, we're back now. Pardon the, uh, interruption. Crash, bring me crystals! At any rate, I change this boss by having this be the second phase of the fight, like the first phase sees you fighting Cortex in a real final boss battle. Well, I'm not exactly sure what that final boss would be. I'll just cheat and say that this super cool Crash 2 mod by YouTuber Aramu is pretty much perfect in what I had in mind. Fucking sick, bro. Now, all that said, the bosses, maybe outside of the final one, aren't so bad that they take away from the game. But when a game is as damn good as Crash 2 is, the few places where it falters does stand out a little bit more. But it doesn't take away from an overall amazing sequel. Beating Cortex, however, will not get you the true ending of the game this time. You'll have to collect all the gems to truly put a stop to Cortex's plan. If you do manage to do that, which again is no simple feat, but certainly much easier to do than in the first game, and honestly has so much new hidden content that I would pretty much say it's mandatory to at least do it once. You get a cool cutscene of Crash and Coco helping Nitrous Brio blow Cortex the fuck up. And so ends Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. And this time this true ending is 100% canon, no caveats. With our destroying of Cortex's space station having actual consequences in the sequel. But of course, if you're playing this game through the Insane Trilogy, you also have the optional time relics to collect which again, were not originally there. That said, unlike Crash 1, where you pretty much need to fundamentally play the game a different way in order to do well at them, collecting all the relics in Crash 2 is actually pretty close to how your experience will end up being getting all the relics in Crash Warped. Again, the first real game to introduce this collectible. This is helped by the fact that in the Insane Trilogy version of Crash 2, after beating Dr. Neo Cortex, you earn the running ability from Crash Warped. This allows Crash to, well, run faster as well as jump farther and overall break several parts of the platforming over your knee much more easily. Again, if you're like me and going after at least the gold relics, you'll find that the game also expects you to not only use this running ability, but use it in junction with advanced platforming moves the game straight up never tells you, like the jump jump spin, which allows you to jump super high and far. 
allowing you, for example, to skip these sections in the first couple levels with these wraps in order to get a better time. Because the levels are far less reliant on timing-based platforming and instead are more reliant on simply avoiding obstacles, these levels are already far closer to the design philosophy of Crash Warped, and thus make for a fun challenge to get relics in since while you will have to be moving super fast through the levels, you'll find the main difficulty is needing to think and act faster with jumps, spins, and super jumps, as well as the well-placed super spin jump so you don't die on the way to the end. And once again, I found myself really enjoying playing through this for my retrospective. There are some really difficult levels though, some that took a long ass time to beat, but again, were very rewarding to finally conquer. Besides that, I will note that while I had far more to say about the level's art design in the first game uh, versus the Insane Trilogy's approach, this time around I think they are far more comparable to one another. The same issue from before with some of the cartoony aesthetic of being lost with these much more realistic visuals is true here as well. However, the general tone and feeling of the levels in Crash 2 are pretty faithful to the originals in the Insane Trilogy. And as I stated before, the animations of nearly every character is much more fluid and more fully utilizing the PS1. Crash himself having many more animations, including several new idle animations, and just overall looking far better than his first game self. He even does that little paranoid look that he does so often in the original, though not nearly as much. Also, he has some pretty funny and gruesome death animations, again, mirroring that Looney Tunes sense of over-exaggeration with everything, including cartoony injuries. <laughs> Crash 2 is Crash Bandicoot at his best in his purest form. It's a game that builds upon the foundation of the first and just does nearly everything better, from the gameplay to the story to the visuals. It's no wonder Crash 2 is often considered the fan favorite, and it's a game that cemented Crash as an icon of not just PlayStation, but gaming culture as a whole. So, where does that leave the third and final game in the Crash Bandicoot PS1 trilogy? How does one make a sequel that lives up to Crash Bandicoot 2? After the massive success of Crash 2, Naughty Dog had their work cut out for them with this third entry. Crash Warped is interesting because it follows the perfect outline of what I like to call third entry syndrome. You see, it goes like this. You have a first entry that lays the foundation for the rest of the series. It's good, has a unique charm about it but is eventually surpassed by its sequel that improves in nearly every way possible and cuts away any unnecessary fat and is generally agreed upon by the larger fan base to be the better entry. Then by the time we get the third entry, there is usually a divide as the game needs something fresh. It needs to be bigger, better, have new gameplay mechanics, styles, new characters, possibly even new playable characters in order to stay fresh. This usually divides audiences somewhat with one side thinking the third entry is the best as it's basically the second entry plus so much more, while the other side might argue that the third entry is good but ultimately adds too many new mechanics and things that take away from the core gameplay that is presented in the second entry, making for a more muddled experience. And of course, there will also be those that will argue that the first entry is the best too, because it's probably the most different from the others, since the second and third one will have a lot in common most likely, oddly enough making the first one a bit of a black sheep in comparison. Now, not every game franchise goes through this, and some see this divide far more than others, but it does tend to be the formula that's often played out, even if by total accident. Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 and Knuckles, Sly 2 and Sly 3, Spyro 2 and Spyro 3, Ratchet and Clank 2 and Ratchet and Clank 3, Jack 2 and Jack 3, Tie 2 and Tie 3. The list goes on, and these are just mostly platformer franchises. It can also go beyond video games and can also be applied to film trilogies, but in a different sense, of course. 
All this preamble is really to point out the crash warp fits this description perfectly, with this either being people's favorite entry in the trilogy or falling behind the second one for reasons that I've noted. So with all that being said, what do I have to say about this entry and where do I personally think it stands? It's totally cool, your children will drool, but parents will play it when the kids are at school. School! Sorry. Canadian Tire, give like Santa, save like Scrooge. Jumping into the story, this philosophy of bigger and more is shown immediately. Oh. For heaven's sake, are we still doing this fucking skit? How long is this video anyway? Oh. <laughs> well, shit didn't work out for me. Uh, Ivy Cortex. Again! When Crash teamed up with that rat fucking traitorous bitch Brio! They blew up the Cortex Vortex and cost Cortex billions of dollars he was never going to get back! When the pieces of the broken space station came crashing down to Earth, which was totally Crash and Brio's fault, might I add, one of the pieces fell into the tomb of Uka Uka, freeing him from some sort of spirit prison. Fate had yet again tempted old Cortex. Uka Uka is basically the masked version of Satan and ends up lecturing me about all my apparent failures and trying to take over the world and kill Crash Bandicoot. Well, Uka Uka has a plan to take over the world using the power crystals, but this time going back through time to get them all. He enlists the help of Dr. Entropy, a creepy blue time god or something, along with his virgin time machine. Together, we plan to take over the universe and all of time. Oh, but of course, Crash, Coco, and Aku Aku, who just so happens to be the brother of Uka Uka, come and find our time-traveling thing somehow, and are bound and determined to stop us yet again. Oh, gives me a fucking migraine just thinking about it. I wonder who will win. A mad scientist, mass Satan, and a virgin time traveling demigod. Or two orange fucking rats and mass Jesus or something. The suspense is killing me, along with this goddamn headache. Oh, 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 are we done yet? Can I please leave? I'm just so, so fucking tired. Oh. Crash Warped once again steps it up from its predecessor with this plot of time travel, new villains, and a far grander plan at work. Uka Uka brings a new dynamic to the story, creating a new big bad to which all the other big bads fall under. His introduction scolding Dr. Cortex, who pleads on his knees for forgiveness, is a powerful image narratively, showcasing his dominance and presence in the series immediately. Then you add to that the mysterious existence of Dr. Entropy, who looms in the shadows of the scene, just out of sight before his grand introduction. It's just a perfectly intimidating and villainous scene that will always stick out in my brain. In the Insane Trilogy, the scene was altered a bit with more dynamic movement of the characters and camera, as well as Dr. Entropy coming through a portal rather than constantly being imminent in the background in the dark, moody lighting. It's not terrible. I mean, I do like Uka Uka's animation. It still gets most of the point across that these guys are not foes to be trifled with, but it's presented in a tone that I think is just far, far inferior to the original. I mean, the animations are really nice, again, but sometimes subtlety works a lot more than in-your-face cartooniness, I suppose. 
I also love that this is the first time where we see Aku Aku talk to Crash and Coco, as well as the first time in which we see their little house. Aku Aku is like a mentor for them both, and something about seeing them all around the fire as he tells them the stories of the great evil of his brother Uka Uka just feels cozy. We get to see their weird little mutant animal and ancient mask family dynamic. I love it. Now of those new villains, you might think that Cortex is much more downplayed and set off as more of a minor villain this time around. But this is actually far from the case. In fact, this is the best of Dr. Cortex yet, because we have these very serious and intimidating villains to deal with. Cortex is put into an interesting position as the twice over failure that's no longer fully running the show anymore, which brings out the cynic in him. He's tired, irritated, and gets more and more pessimistic as Crash gets closer and closer through the game to once again stopping his plan. What? Where was I? Oh, Tiny was a good fellow. He hated everyone and everything, but a good heart nonetheless. Please be more reasonable with my minions next time. It's funny how history repeats itself. Yet again, Engine has failed to defeat you. More this, we must destroy you! <laughs> oh, my aching head. I'm not feeling myself these days. So, the end is in sight. Gather another five crystals, and again you will have foiled my plan. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the part where I'm supposed to be angry, full of rage, incensed beyond belief. I absolutely love it. This is really the game that best defined Cortex and the character that he would come to be known and loved for. And when he became one of my all-time favorite video game villains when I first played this game as a kid. There is something kind of refreshing about a villain seeing a rather unfortunate pattern in their life and while he still tries, ultimately by the time you've gotten through most of the game, he knows all too well his chances of success are pretty slim and gradually falling apart. Contrasted by Uka Uka, who is quite confident in his abilities to be able to finally put a stop to you and take over the world. Moving past the story, the gameplay here is less of an evolution and more of a fine-tuning of what was seen in Crash 2. The same smooth movements here, jumping over and around obstacles, avoiding enemies, and we're even collecting crystals and gems just like we were in Crash 2. Of course, this time around, instead of exploring ancient ruins, dark jungles, snowy mountains, etc., we're time traveling, baby! Crash and Coco traverse the Jurassic Age of Dinosaurs, ancient China, old Egypt, fantasy old England, pirate times, water levels, and yeah, the time traveling aspect of the game is definitely made more so to have Crash jump and spin his way through some more unfamiliar places. It's a nice breath of fresh air after going through the more unnaturalistic levels of 1 and 2. Add that with some of the new abilities like a double jump, a mega spin which allows you to glide over pits, a super body slam which lets you break boxes within its impact, and a wumpa bazooka which is, yeah, a bazooka for blowing up enemies and boxes from far away. And the speed running ability which I noted earlier, the crash running ability, all these abilities are gained by defeating a boss, which, like in Crash 2, can be faced after beating 5 levels in any order that you want, collecting each one of those levels crystals, and then getting to the end, rinse and repeat. Giving Crash a new ability after each successful boss battle I think is also a really cool reward and something to freshen up the gameplay and keep things interesting as you move throughout the game. Now to some extent some of these abilities will uh, trivialize certain challenges in the game as these abilities without a doubt make Crash a fucking super platformer character but before you go thinking that that makes the game too easy uh, just hold it off for right now. Keep that thought in the back of your head. We're going to get back to it in a minute. 
I do think it's interesting that all these levels are in warp rooms, which are all smaller pieces of an even greater warp room hub. I remember as a kid when I would get stuck on a level or two and would go and look at the other warp rooms ahead of me, running into the electric fences like they would eventually give or something. It lays out the whole journey that's ahead of you, and it's kind of cool. Though I will say narratively, Crash and Co. finding the time machine warp room that I'm assuming Dr. Nefarious Trophy runs within literally near moments after finding out Uka Uka was free is kind of gone unexplained. I guess we are to assume Aku Aku just knew where it was, or maybe Coco found it through her smart somehow? I don't know, but that's just all my own headcanon ideas to try and fix the plot hole. It's a small detail thing, but they could have had at least one quick little scene to explain it. And because it never actually is explained, it is just an objective plot hole. However, more than just locales and movesets have changed. Like many 3D platformers starting around this time frame, Crash Warped has a ton of level and gameplay variety. You'll still be mostly platforming, spinning foes, smashing boxes as usual, but you'll also be swimming through water levels, racing Cortex's minions atop a motorcycle, shooting down Cortex's planes and blimps via a World War I plane. Oh, and also for the first time in the series, you get to play as Coco. Coco levels are never platforming levels, however. Instead, she has more vehicle-based levels, riding on top of her baby tiger across the Wall of China, or jumping off slopes and dodging bombs on our jet ski. In the Insane Trilogy remake, however, you are actually allowed to play as Coco in almost all the levels in Crash 1, 2, and 3 via her using the time machine in Warped to have her go back through time to help her brother out. It's a really cool little in-universe reason for having her be playable throughout all the games. And it's just pretty fun playing as her, especially when you're going for all those gems and relics when going through all the levels in any game a second time. She also has a lot of cool little idle animations. Speaking of time relics, they're the brand new collectible in Crash Warped alongside you needing crystals and gems. Time relics, I've already pretty well covered the mechanics of them by now, uh, but it's important to note that this was, again, the first game where they were required to fully complete the game and get the true ending. Though in order to beat the game, all you gotta do is get the basic bitch blue sapphire relics, which are the easiest times to achieve. However, in the Insane Trilogy remakes, as I said before, you need to get at least the gold time in each level to get the PlayStation trophy, if you care that much about that. Which, low-key, I kinda do, but I'll pretend I'm cool and say that I don't. But still, it is the most fun at least going after the gold and getting a few platinums by accident in my experience. You can also go after the absolute mad lad crazy platinum relic times, of course. But once again, you get nothing for it except, well, for bragging rights. Though if there is a game in this trilogy it would be the most worth trying your hand at this feat in, is definitely Crash Warped. Unlike Crash 1, which just isn't designed around speedy platforming, or Crash 2, which works better by merit of the levels being closer into Warp's design philosophy, but still ultimately don't hold a candle to the expert level design that went into not only making Crash Warp levels better to speedrun, but also faster in general. Crash Warped rarely has moments when you are honestly waiting for something to move out of your way or a platform to move over to you. It still has it, mind you, but the powers that you get later on can easily allow you to circumvent even those things. I don't ever really hear people say this, but Crash Warped is a 3D platformer designed around speed, almost the polar opposite to this series' first entry, with every new ability you gain in the game being yet another tool to fully taking advantage of this new design ideology. A fully kitted Crash can slide, double jump, spin glide, and dash his way through levels like you were playing a strange combination of Crash 2 and Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog, because 
well, you're running really fucking fast. Crash 2, because that speed can still only be achieved through pure platforming skill. It's a marvel to behold watching people run through this game with full confidence. And because the game is designed around this, it all becomes a challenge of pure mechanical skill and is just so much fucking fun. It really is worth replaying through all the levels all over again just to try to get the relics because only then can you really appreciate how much care went into these levels to make for both a challenging but exhilarating platforming challenge that nothing was quite doing at that time. Actually on that point, I recently discovered and started watching a YouTuber by the name of Pariah695. This is because I have a crippling addiction to videos about Sonic the Hedgehog, but also because he recently reviewed the original Crash Trilogy and some other Crash games as well. And as someone who never had played them at that, I found his perspective on the original trilogy or insane trilogy pretty interesting because he actually enjoyed Crash 1 the most, pretty much loving that game, and was of the opinion that the trilogy progressively got worse as it went along. Not bad, mind you, but that they strayed away from the original point. His primary reason for this is because he believed the new powers broke the level design in ways that the developers didn't intend in Crash Warped. He also didn't like the vehicle levels, but that's a fair enough point and we'll get to that in a minute. I actually have heard this before from other YouTubers that the powers that Crash gets in this game make the game perhaps too easy, or that the levels aren't designed with these powers in mind. Which if you were going through the game normally, I might see how you could come away with that perspective. However, when going after the relics in Crash Warped, it becomes crystal clear to me at least that this quote unquote breaking of the game's level design is in fact intended. Especially if you do try and go after the platinum relics, you'll find that those paths you have to take, those powers you need to use that are again quote unquote breaking the game is suddenly needed to accomplish this task. Which I think is a pretty clear cut objective bit of evidence that this was in fact intentional, not a design oversight. Now I didn't point out this video in particular to throw shade at Pariah695. In fact, I'd say go and check out his content. It's pretty good stuff, even if I do tend to disagree with him a fair bit. But I did point this out as an example because I often notice on the other side of people arguing difficulty in games that they will point to examples of how they were able to break the game, which implies that the developers didn't intend for this to be an option, or that you were just so good that you clearly broke the game, made it too easy. When oftentimes this is very much an intended way to play the game if you have the skill to pull it off. Maybe if we're talking about glitches and the like, then sure, that's pretty much breaking the game at that point. But using the skills the devs gave you to play the game? Nah, that's not breaking the game, it's just understanding the mechanics and mastering them. Which is, you know, pretty fun, and some might say part of the point. You didn't break the game of Sonic the Hedgehog because you learned how to best utilize its momentum-based platforming. You mastered that mechanic and are now a pro at it, which again, is fun to do. Clearly intended by the developers and, once again, part of the point. Of course, I can understand enjoying Crash 1's level design philosophy versus Crash Warp's level design philosophy, since they are pretty polar opposite when it comes down to it even in their similarities. But I very much think both are quite intentional and do what they set out to do quite well. On that note, I think that's the reason Platinum Relics times are here to begin with. You don't have to get them, but somewhere along the line, Naughty Dog must have realized how much fun it was to play the game this way, and thus made a little reward for those who wish to push these levels and their skill set to the limit. The game is practically begging you to go fast once you have the tools. Even the new crates introduced into this game that cycle between basic boxes or extra lives beep with anticipation for you to spin them before they turn into an indestructible silver crate, encouraging you to keep a brisk pace. As a result of this design philosophy, there are now far less pits, far more enemy variety, with yet again some fun death animations to go alongside them. Oh, me? Excuse me. My heart is Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you. You are so totally whipped. I'm Brad. Let's ride a bicycle bill for two. Then we can go to the potpourri store and then go buy sheets. 
Would you rather be at home shooting a bazooka or watching a chick flick? <laughs> chick flick, bazooka. Chick flick, bazooka. Happy end, Brad. Who's that? Happy end. <laughs> Brad. I don't know. Brad? Of course, the vehicle levels are kind of another story, with some of them being a lot of fun, like the intense way you traverse the China Wall levels on the back of Pura, and again, being a lot of fun to collect the relics in. While others are kind of the same thing, but way more annoying because of the awkward physics that come with riding the jet ski at full speed without fucking up. Which kind of brings me back to that earlier point about the division that comes between two and three sequels. Many have pointed out the abundance of vehicle levels in this game as a core reason for why they prefer Crash 2 over Crash Warped. The argument here being that Crash 2 was simply Crash at his best at a constant rate, while Crash Warped is also Crash at his best, but with mini games that for them get in the way of that pure platformer experience. You might be wondering where I personally stand on the debate, and for a long time I didn't really have that answer. I just enjoyed them both equally. But as I started noticing more and more division about the vehicle levels in Crash Warped and heard more opinions on it, I started to consider if I would enjoy Crash Warped more if it were consistently just platforming without the abundance of minigame levels. A conclusion that I came to was that the minigames in Crash Warps do not hinder my enjoyment of the game, but they don't exactly strengthen it either. Some of them just feel like a natural evolution, I suppose. Crash has ridden on the back of furry animals before, and even jet boards in the past. But then, when nearly half of the level's roster in this game are dedicated to these other forms of gameplay, maybe it is a little too much. I suppose it just depends on, well, subjectively, how fun that you particularly think they are. I could completely understand why someone would not enjoy the abundance of levels that aren't traditional, well, crash levels. I personally really, really enjoy the Pura levels as well as the motorcycle levels. The swimming levels I think are pretty okay, the plane levels I think are, well, pretty nothing considering how easy they are and how quick they are. They aren't bad, but they're not really anything that good either. And finally, the jet ski levels, which without a doubt take up the most additional levels in the game, are probably my least favorite, honestly. Again, I don't hate them, but by the third one of them, I'm really getting bored of the concept of them at this point. And we're getting into like, what, the fifth one at some point? I'm just totally done. I like, I just, I, I don't want to be playing this level right now. But on the other hand, the traditional crash levels that are here in this game, I believe are some of the best that the series has ever had up to this point. The levels are not only as beautiful as ever, with even more loony and interesting enemies to spin, but the level design as I noted earlier is far more open for experimentation. It's still a linear path at the end of the day, but everything is just finely tuned. The way Crash jumps and spins, and the way you are actually rewarded for utilizing all your abilities to try and get through the levels faster. The secret pathways, the way something like a Triceratops chasing after you, or being able to jump atop a baby dinosaur or ride it, something that would have had a whole level in either Crash 2 or 1 dedicated to it, are just simply set pieces in far more varied levels in Warped. Bigger levels that, while yes, end up having themes reused a few times, make the excellent choice of always changing the time of day or weather of each level to make them all feel varied. Take the medieval levels, for example. The first one takes place on a sunny morning. The sky is blue, the setting is perfectly lit. It's beautiful. And in the Insane Trilogy, this is a case where I actually believe that this level looks miles better with its lighting system. It really makes this place look super vibrant. Next time we enter a medieval stage, it's now evening. The sky is orange and red, and all the levels cast in those vibrant hues as well. Then the last time we enter that level, the variation is now foggy and gray. It's raining. The atmosphere is far grimmer with the addition of whatever the fuck these things are. That's the other thing. 
Unlike Crash 2, each time a level theme is reused, new enemy variations and interesting new obstacles are introduced to keep it all fresh and have you wondering what new stuff that you'll have to conquer this time. Same goes for the vehicle levels, by the way. And then there is also something else that I have yet to bring up, which is also a clear improvement over Crash 2, and that is the new and improved boss battles. Ooga Ooga and Cortex want Tiny get crystals and bring them to Big Colosseum in Rome. Crash, leave them for Tiny or Crash get crushed. The first boss being a returning tiny tiger, which while an easy boss is certainly full of spectacle as he tries to stomp on you in his grand Greek arena. And every time you get a hit on him, he unleashes a pack of hungry lion that you have to dodge and or spin out of the way. Not that difficult, but it's already an improvement over more than half the bosses in Crash 2. Next is without a doubt one of the best boss fights in the game and one of the best boss characters in the series, Dingo Dial. Good day, mates. Dingo Dial's the name, and Uka Uka and Cortex gave me orders to bring the crystals to them during the Ice Ages. So give me the goods and shove off, or I'll roast you. Dingo Dial is surrounded by three layers of icicles, which makes it impossible to reach him. Luckily, and unluckily for you, he has a flamethrower which he shoots fireballs up into the sky for you to dodge, and then straight up beams of fire that break the ice on impact, thus allowing you the chance to hit him once he's broken enough of the icicles to make a clear opening. The thing is though, is Dingo Dial only shoots the ice that you're in front of. So you gotta move fast and bait him into destroying his own protection. All while this jamming ass best track in the game gives you such a hectic atmosphere that has always made me vividly remember this boss fight as one of the fucking best. Also in the Insane Trilogy, they made this boss slightly more difficult by occasionally making him fire where you're about to be instead of where you are, which can be quite the tricky thing to avoid at first, and again makes this boss fight just really fucking cool. The next boss is Docris Entropy. Well, haven't we gotten far for a pair of fuzzy marsupials? I am Dr. Nefarious Trophy, master of time and creator of the very time twister machine you see before you. Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex have sent me to end this little charade, so you won't be leaving my area with the crystals. I swear it. Wait, you mean the guy who runs this time machine and one of the new threats from the opening of the game? I've thought this since I was a kid, but it feels like this boss fight should have been the fourth one before Cortex rather than the third. Either way though, Entropy is a pretty cool boss fight with a great intro. Now you're on my time, you little skunk! Give me the crystals! <laughs> It's basically a pure platforming and timing challenge as you jump over fire beams and fireballs. It's not as good as Dingle Dial in my opinion, and with how cool the actual character is, I think he should have had like two extra hit points, and that the boss really should have gotten extra tricky with those last two hit points. But nonetheless, the fight is still at least memorable, especially with how Cortex reacts to the master of the time machine being defeated. You insolent, insignificant morons! By defeating Entropy, you have placed us all in grave risk! <laughs> Crash Coco, you must realize that this time twister machine is very delicate. Without Dr. Entropy's constant care and control, who knows what it will do? <laughs> you know what's funny? They say that like something crazy is going to happen. Like stuff in the levels is going to start getting weird or out of control. But nothing really changes. Oh well. On that note, I will say I've been using these little clips from each boss before I jump into them, but that is something else that this game introduced. These little introductions and intermissions to each boss of each area. I love this addition because it adds an extra layer of characterization to each boss that you fight as well as build up to the eventual face off with them. So, Crash Bandicoot, we meet again. Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex want me to teach you a lesson. Well, I've made a few modifications to my mechanics since our last encounter. So back off or be deleted. 
Next is the ever great boss having engine, fighting in a giant fucking mech like any true boss does, against Coco in her spaceship. Like in the second game, the point of this boss is to dodge all the incoming attacks and shoot his weapons once he stops firing them for a moment. It's a fun fight, but where it really amps up is when it's revealed that there's a second phase where Engine gets a whole host of new weapons and Coco herself upgrades her ship with her baby tiger in the back to fight along with her. And ah oh man, is this such a fun fight. And honestly, as far as Engine boss fights go, I don't think it really was ever topped in the series after this. Well, I mean, Crash 4's engine boss fight is also pretty good. But this is just fucking epic. It's a frantic bullet hell that while isn't actually all that hard, especially since it's one of those bosses that it gets easier the more parts that you break off of him, the pure spectacle alone more than makes up for that. Once again, you have outsmarted and outspun my best henchmen. I should be rather upset, shouldn't I? And in fact, we're furious! But it seems you have overlooked one small detail, you little orange delivery boy! Now that you have gathered all the crystals, all we have to do is take them from you! Finally, we come to the big grand finale of this game and the trilogy as a whole. And unlike the disappointing final boss of the second game, we have without a doubt the best final boss thus far. It's Crash vs Cortex in a battle to save time as we know it. All while at the same time, Aku Aku and Uka Uka, old brothers turned enemies, are also fighting it out to this killer ass soundtrack. There is finality in the air. You'll have to dodge Cortex's laser gun while also avoiding Aku Aku and Uka Uka's constant onslaught on one another, which changes after every hit point is taken off of Cortex by waiting for his shield to go down, jumping over all of the mines he tosses out afterward, and then spinning his ass down this vacuum hole. Oh, and while I'm thinking about it, has anyone ever wondered why the boss life bars in this game look like tickets with the boss's names on them that slowly takes away parts of their name with each successful hit point taken off? Well, I've had a theory for a while that the reason that this is the case is because Crash is kicking ass and taking names, bitch. Which he does to Cortex once again. If you only beat the game for the first time, then you get this funny cutscene of Cortex wooing over his third loss and how he wishes to retire. Defeated again? This is not fair! Maybe I should retire to a nice big beach with a nice big drink and a woman with nice big bags of ice for my head. It's not over, Bandicoot. There are still the gems. We still have a chance to triumph. <laughs> However, if you go back and collect all the gems in the game, which will also require you to collect all the relics to do so since some of the gems are hidden in the secret warp room that's first unlocked by successfully collecting five time relics and each new level being unlocked every five relics collected, and then you go and fight the final boss yet again. Yes, it is true. The Bandicoot has brought all of the crystals and all of the gems to me. Ultimate power is mine. The world as we know it is about to end. You will get the true final ending with Cortex, Entropy, and Uka Uka paying the price for playing with time. The time twister machine could not hold itself together. We were lucky to escape. Give me the mask! With it I shall take over the world! Come on! It is difficult to say what has happened to our enemies, but I doubt we will see them for a long time. It's a great reward for going through this game twice over to collect everything, and is now the canon transition into the next Crash Bandicoot game, Crash 4 It's About Time. Though my one and only little nitpick is I wish that the final boss was different for when you collect everything since they fully acknowledge you're here again with all the gems this time, you'd think that they might want to try and change up their strategy a bit, or that there was at least an extra phase or something, but 
Oh well, it certainly doesn't take away from one of the best 3D platformers ever created. A game is so good that the series itself afterward would be hiding in or trying to get out from under its enormous shadow. The original Crash Bandicoot trilogy, whether you choose to play them on original hardware for the graphical and gameplay marvels that they were at the time, emulate them through Duck Station on your nice high-end PC for a slightly more tuned up experience, or through the Insane trilogy with all its quality of life changes, but still genuine experience of the originals that can be had from them, I cannot recommend this series enough. If I were to say what my personal favorite from the trilogy is, honestly, it's really fucking hard to pick. They're all amazing games, and they're all games with slightly different goals in mind, as I think I've showcased here. Even though they have a lot in common, I think the evolution from Crash 1 to Crash Warped is pretty apparent in how the design philosophy changed from entry to entry. If I were to recommend you the one that was pretty much the closest to being perfect, the one that I think encompasses the entire franchise, I would definitely say Crash 2. It's the right balance of difficulty and complexity that I think really does the series justice. But if I was speaking in personal terms, I'd say my personal favorite is probably Crash Warped. I love Crash 1 for how innovative and challenging it is, and I will defend that game to hell and back since again, I think people are way too harsh on that game for simply having the audacity of being a more difficult 3D platformer than maybe some might be used to. I love Crash 2 for how smooth it is to control and how it introduced so many core mechanics that would come to define what Crash Bandicoot really is as a franchise. And as I said, if I were to recommend only one, it'd be the one that I recommend. But I love Crash Warp the most personally because, in my mind, it perfected what it could mean to be a Crash game. Sure, there is a lot of extra stuff that you may or may not like, but the character that was added through the cutscenes, the freedom of movement that's given to you through Crash's extra abilities, the remarkable improvement to the boss battles, and as abstract as it is, the overall vibe of Crash Warp, I just really dig it. But bear in mind that how much I like Crash Warped more over, say, Crash 1 or 2 is by literally just a smidgen. I wanted to make this video not only to highlight the progress of the original trilogy of Crash Bandicoot and just how innovative the series was from its roots, but also to shed light on a series that is finally getting the love and attention it deserves from dedicated creators that know what made these games so great to begin with in what was a long timeline of games that seemed to understand less and less what it was about these games that people love to begin with. Crash Bandicoot at its core is a trilogy of 3D platformers that wasn't afraid to present a real challenge to the player. A trilogy that had to figure out what it meant to be a 3D platformer in a world where such a thing didn't exist yet. A trilogy that would then come to define 3D platformers and perhaps even video games going forward in the same way Mario 64 did, but never gets the same recognition for it that 64 does. It's a series that helped in the success of the PlayStation brand. The series that was put through the ringer until it died for 10 long years due to mismanagement and mistakes. It's the series that was resurrected once again to both praise and critical success, as well as the cries of people who forgot what a challenging 3D platformer once looked like. It's the first video game series that taught me from a young age about the fun and the joy and the reward of perseverance in the face of daunting tasks, even if only in a video game. The first truly difficult video game I ever played and beat after two long, long years of trying over and over again as a kid. And a series that I'll always treasure. The same way Dr. Neocortex treasures that last balding piece of hair fluff sat atop his table-shaped head.
What? Well, fuck you too, you melodramatic bitch. That was so uncalled for, you long-winded feather fuck. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. As I noted at the beginning of this video, it's been a little while since I've done a video game analysis type video. Like, probably close to two years as a matter of fact. So be sure to comment down below and let me know what you thought about it. As well as your own thoughts on the Crash Bandicoot trilogy and possibly what other video game series or games in general that you'd like me to cover in the future. I also want to thank all my supporters over on Patreon and here on YouTube via memberships including all of you Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as all my great Night Owls, including Doggy NGT, Macabre Kaiju, Ho Hot, Medusa's Hex, and Forgotten Ace, as well as a very special thank you to my Arch Owls, the Good Chi Vibe Zen Garden Party, and the Symphonic Justice. That being said, until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl flying off.